Ebba, I suggest we begin and then we will usher in the other panelists as they come in. Perfect, thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ebba Kalondo. I'm the spokesperson for the chairperson of the African Union Commission. And it's certainly a big honor for me to be able to join you on the second day uh, of this high level dialogue. Um, and also for the plenary session of the launch of the Women, Governance and Political Participation Initiative here today. Um, my job is probably the easiest one this afternoon, um, and it's to be able to introduce um, the Commissioner of Political Affairs here at the African Union Commission, Her Excellency Minata Samate Sesuma, for her opening remarks, which will be then followed by opening remarks of Her Excellency Ahuna Ezukonwa, who is the Assistant Secretary General and Director for UNDP Africa. Excellency, um, Commissioner for Political Affairs. Apologies, I believe we should begin with uh, Madame Ahuna and then we will have Madame Binata after. Very well. Um, Madame Ahuna, welcome. You have the floor. I'm muting myself. Thank you, Eva. So good to see you. It's been a long time. Thanks, thanks for being on that seat. Uh, we appreciate you very much. Um, let me uh, start by recognizing Her Excellency Mrs. Ellen Johnson Solid, former president of the Republic of Liberia and our patron uh, of the Africa Women Leaders Network. Welcome, Madam. Before I move on, I have two things to thank you for. The first one is for being the first director of the Regional Bureau for Africa of UNDP, the first woman director that broke the ceiling and opened the, the gates for us. Um, and uh, today I sit in that position, building on the very solid foundation that you laid. And it was possible because you showed that women could do it. Women could be leaders uh, at that level. So it's possible for people like me to rise to that level because of uh, what you started. And the second thing is to thank you for telling me and showing us that there is life after the UN <laughs> and that uh, we can indeed progress. But a warm welcome and what a pleasure it is to have you uh, with us today. We also have joining us, if not already with us, Her Excellency Mrs. Tale Wakizwede, the president of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, my big sister and mentor. Uh, I know you have so many things uh, lined up for today, but you made it a point to join us. So thank you for being here. Uh, joining us also would be His Excellency, Mr. Musa Faki Muhammad, the chairperson of the African Union Commission. Uh, warm welcome to, to, to you, sir. And, of course, my dear sister, Her Excellency, Mrs. Amina Mohammed, uh, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, welcome, welcome, DSG. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we have uh, several other dignitaries with us today, and I want to extend also a warm welcome to all of them. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for joining us for a second day. Yesterday was so vibrant, exciting, and really rich. And we build on that conversation that began yesterday. It's such a pleasure and an honor to welcome all of you to this high-level virtual forum on women in governance and political participation. It is pivot a pivotal moment as we meet today under the umbrella of the Africa Women Leaders Network to launch the Women in Governance and Political Participation Initiative aimed at enhancing African women's role in leadership. Today, we go a significant step further in the fight for gender equality in decision-making. Our action today 
will drive change to ensure that women are present in significant numbers at the tables where decisions that affect us all are made, particularly in the context of the unfolding reality of COVID-19 that heralds a vastly different future. There is a stark reality that brings us here. And let me share some numbers. Although women make up for 54% of practitioners in formal jobs in the health sector, they consist of only 39% of the senior leadership positions and 20% of the corporate boards in the health sector. Africa has only 13 female ministers of health. And let me add that these women health ministers have provided outstanding leadership to the COVID-19 response. Only 22.2% of all African parliamentarians are female and only 23% of African ministers um, are female, uh, including Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. The share of all parliamentarians under 30 years of age is only 2.3%. So we have a challenge there in terms of nurturing the next generation. Africa has only four female ministers of finance. UNDP's new social norms uh, index of 2019 shows that globally, 50% of the world's men and 60% of women feel that men make better political leaders than women. In 13 African countries, the bias is higher. 67% of African women and 79% of men agree with the notion that men make better political leaders and it is not essential for women and men to have the same political rights. This presents one of the reasons why we're here today. These numbers indeed remind us uh, that time is up. And my dream is that together we change the reality of women and girls across Africa. Two years from now, if we are successful, we will celebrate a growing list of leading women across the continent. There will be the better numbers and even more demonstrable evidence that things are changing for the better for women in leadership. And it's my conviction that this platform can do just that. It can act as the support structure to unearth more outstanding young parliamentarians like Ms. Upendo Furaha uh, Paneza of Tanzania, the firebrand leader we listened to yesterday. It can be that space where women feel nurtured, get support and boost to carry on delivering on the important work of fighting poverty in their communities. Ms. Ms. Upendo, who really impressed me when she spoke yesterday, and all the women leaders she represents must act with impatience to find solutions for the bottlenecks that hold African women back. In the COVID-19 context, Actions that embrace the informal sector and SMEs, the small and medium enterprises. Actions that leverage digitalization for women businesses. Actions that single out women for social protection programs. And actions that ensure that young people are prioritized. Okay, I've joined. Will help to give a face to the unique value of women in governance, leading with purpose and a commitment to society. Because you are here, you can make a personal stand and responsibility to support the ideals of this initiative. These ideals are the following. One, to enforce the effective implementation of legal, regulatory, and policy frameworks. Mic, please. Thank you. Two, to come together to build a critical mass of women in decision-making at all levels. Three, to go beyond small scale and silo gender initiatives and tackle root causes of women's exclusion, which affect women's access to health, education, and jobs, such as early marriage. And fourthly, to guarantee women's equal access to assets and resources, such as technology, skills, and finance, that allow women to bounce back stronger. The barriers to women's participation in leadership are known. We must tackle these barriers to create an ecosystem that works for all, women included. 
UNDP is already investing in developing transformational leadership capacity. The world is waking up to the importance of feminized leadership with empathy, compassion, communication, and decisive action. With the African Union, UNDP is modeling the new generation of African leaders through the African Young Women Leaders Program, contributing to the AU's 1 million by 2021 initiative to accelerate youth engagement, employment, education, and entrepreneurship. Under this initiative, I would like to also go a step further, and I am pleased here to announce that UNDP will invest in a new flagship initiative that reaches uh, young women who are interested in politics to prepare them for community and local leadership as well as national leadership, so they can transform political parties and the electoral landscape. Growing and equipping these young leaders through mentorship, developing their competence, confidence, and sustained access to digital financial and technical resources will be one of the central uh, ten, uh, pillars of this initiative. It will be a one-stop shop for connecting talented and emerging leaders with their destiny to give back to their communities and to serve the world. And I want to challenge each, each and every one of us today to commit to rise with African women leaders as our DSG has been championing within the organization. It starts with each one of us, each and every one of us, we can make this difference and let's make it count. I am so happy that we as the UN system working closely with the African Union in the various pillars, with my uh, collaborators, the, the, the um, executive director of UN Women, uh, who is uh, co-chairing uh, this platform with our sister Binta uh, Dio, but also with uh, the executive secretary of, of, of uh, ECA, Madame Vera Zongwe, who is championing the economic pillar, uh, and, and others who are working on different fronts alongside our commissioners. We in UNDP are ready to move with the governance pillar, uh, but working very much in collaboration with all the other pillars because we, are, uh, we have synergies also be uh, between them. So with this, I want to say once again, uh, what a pleasure it is to have this forum and to have all of you uh, join us today. And I hand back to you now, Eva. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to you, Ahuna, for your leadership, for your, for your sisterhood and for your vision. Uh, and certainly for part of what is now the UNAU initiative to drive and able to, to enable young women enter the UN system through a shared responsibility in making happen what you exactly just said. And this, this, this initiative, which is really a sistership and kinship indeed by the United Nations and the African Union, is also led by the leadership of this commission, which is very female. Um, and I hope the chairperson of the African Union Commission is online, which I know that his desk, as, 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 as filled as it might be, has one very important little souvenir that he got from the United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, I think a year or two ago. And it's a very silent, but very vocal little sign that says, the future is female. So um, I'll be leaving it there. Um, part of that future of that is female here today is also the leadership of the commission, uh, five of the commissioners of the nine member commission leadership here of, 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 is also women, something that the Faki administration is very proud of. And I'm extremely honored to be able to um, to welcome today for the second part of the opening segment, um, Commissioner um, Samate, who is the Commissioner for Political Affairs. Madame la Commissaire, c'est à vous. Merci, Madame la Modératrice. Merci, Eba. Excellence, Madame Salewurk Zeoude, présidente de la République fédérale démocratique d'Éthiopie. Excellence, Madame Hélène Johnson Serlif, ancienne présidente de la République du Libéria. Excellence, Monsieur Moussa Faki Mahamad, président de la Commission de l'Union africaine. Excellence, Madame Amina Mohamed, 
secrétaire générale adjointe des Nations Unies, Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, distingués personnalités du système des Nations Unies, chers euh, commissaires de l'Union africaine, euh, Mesdames et Messieurs, c'est un grand honneur pour moi de prendre la parole en ce moment solennel qui marque le lancement du pilier de la gouvernance du réseau des femmes leaders africaines à Olin, initiative à la, qui a été à, à la base de... de de l'événement que nous avons aujourd'hui et particulièrement le lancement du, de ce pilier « Femmes, gouvernance et participation politique, renforcer le leadership des femmes africaines » sous le thème « Capitaliser le leadership des femmes africaines dans la réponse à la COVID-19 et au-delà de la COVID-19 ». Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, la cérémonie d'aujourd'hui est l'aboutissement d'un long parcours. Je voudrais rappeler qu'en 2017 à New York, moi-même accompagné d'une forte délégation, avons lancé officiellement le réseau des femmes leaders et depuis lors qui a connu de grandes avancées avec des succès. Je voudrais saluer ici deux femmes qui, qui étaient engagées avec moi en 2017. Je citerai Madame Pumzile et Madame Job qui ont veillé à la bonne marche de ce réseau et cofondatrice de ce réseau et surtout le travail assidu qui a été abattu. Je salue également le leadership de Madame la Présidente d'Éthiopie et la patronne de Aulin et Madame Johnson qui par leur parcours exceptionnel sont des modèles pour beaucoup de jeunes et beaucoup de femmes sur le continent africain et surtout leur contribution à faire avancer la cause des femmes. Je ne saurais oublier également Madame Amina Mohamed pour son engagement et sa présence sur le terrain. Nous nous rappelons les visites de terrain qu'elle a eues dans certains pays et nous étions avec elle à certains moments et saluer également sa disponibilité et son engagement. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, nous avons foi au combat que nous menons mais nous sommes aussi conscientes qu'il ne pourrait être gagné sans l'appui des hommes. Nous avons cette chance ici d'avoir le président de la Commission de l'Union africaine avec nous, un homme engagé, un grand homme défenseur de la cause des femmes, et je dirais il est un I for she, comme on le dit en anglais. En la personne du président de la Commission de l'Union africaine, nous avons vu euh, une, un, un homme engagé qui soutient les femmes, qui travaille également pour les femmes et qui a beaucoup plus de femmes dans son cabinet. Merci beaucoup, Excellence, pour cet engagement et nous, femmes, nous, vous, nous sommes reconnaissantes pour cela. Votre engagement ne se limite pas uniquement au niveau de, de l'Union africaine, au-delà, à travers vos responsabilités que vous avez occupées. Et je dirais également, Madame Amina Mohamed et l'ensemble des femmes qui sont là, Madame Hélène Johnson, nous sommes fiers de vous, de votre contribution, et vous êtes des exemples pour les jeunes femmes africaines. Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais relever que des mesures, depuis euh, l'adoption de certains protocoles et de de traiter sur la question des femmes. Des mesures progressistes ont été euh, prises sur le continent africain avec des systèmes de quotas, des listes zébrées et avec des femmes au gouvernement, avec des femmes ministres de la Défense, avec des femmes euh, à tous les niveaux de responsabilité. Mais, mesdames et messieurs, il faut souligner que cette égalité des sexes, certes, est en train de voir le jour, mais beaucoup reste à faire. Et les deux jours, Madame Aouna l'a relevé. Nous étions ensemble depuis les consultations, depuis le début de cette initiative il y a plus d'une année. Les femmes ont relevé les obstacles auxquels elles font face et qui les, les empêchent d'accéder à des postes de direction. Ces, ces barrières sont nombreuses et concernent aussi bien le secteur public que le secteur privé. Et cela ne doit pas nous empêcher d'aller de l'avant. Et l'initiative que nous discutons, discutons euh, analyse les échecs, les problèmes, les difficultés avec les succès. Nous avons écouté des femmes leaders hier en partageant, partageant avec elles leur expérience. 
La valeur de cette initiative réside donc dans ses objectifs qui consistent à, re, à surmonter les obstacles, les difficultés, les institutions et voir comment nous pouvons aller de l'avant. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, au cours des trois derniers jours de, de notre de rencontre, des recommandations ont été faites et qui ne figurent pas dans notre plan d'action qui sera certainement présenté d'ici peu. Des recommandations ont été faites concernant les élections au niveau des partis politiques sur la nécessité d'inclure les partis politiques, de financer les femmes aussi en politique. Les femmes ne doivent pas être uniquement des électrices, elles doivent être aussi des responsables. Nous devons également nous battre pour le e for she qui pourrait ouvrir un espace aux femmes afin qu'elles puissent bénéficier de l'expérience de leur des, des talents et de, des compétences et de l'expérience de certains hommes sur le continent africain. Il faut aussi lever les obstacles et Dieu seul sait, il y en a suffisamment. Comme je le disais, nous avons des beaux textes au niveau de l'Union africaine de, à l'international, mais il a été relevé que ces textes ne sont pas effectivement appliqués. Il faut une stratégie robuste de mise en œuvre. Il a été, re, 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 il a été dit également qu'il faut accorder une place aux jeunes. Les jeunes ont eu l'occasion d'expliquer leurs difficultés et sans oublier euh, la question de la COVID et les, la, les vulnérabilités des femmes et la nécessité de prendre des mesures afin de les protéger, afin qu'elles puissent participer à la gouvernance sur le continent africain et à la gouvernance mondiale. Merci beaucoup, à Madame la modératrice. Et avec mes excuses, nous avons eu des difficultés de connexion. C'est ce qui a fait qu'on n'a pas pu être là avec vous au début de la rencontre. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Commissioner uh, Samate Sesuma, for those for those welcoming words. Um, and it's true that um, communicating in the times of digital have always been quite complicated, but communicating during the times of digital complications during a pandemic has given us um, some lessons that I'm sure we can we can we, we can take forward. But um, it's my great honor right now to go straight to um, probably one of the biggest and certainly the most um, cogent uh, trendsetters and trailblazers for many of the women um, in, this, in this forum today, including myself, um, not just because she's a woman, but she's a leader who is a woman who made it possible for other women to be able to go before her. And it's really my biggest honor to be able to introduce um, and welcome former president of the Republic of Liberia, Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirdi for the keynote address. Am I okay? You are perfect. Eva, um, Madam President is still muted. Perhaps a host can unmute her. If the host could possibly unmute the microphone. Apologies, I think she needs to unmute on her end. La technique. Angela, send um, a host should send her on a mute. Oh. Oh. There we are. No, it's <laughs> one. Just to press it once. 
Est-ce que les techniciens <rire> peuvent nous aider? Madame Johnson est toujours euh, mute. It's set up so she can unmute herself at her end. I think she's getting help. Yeah. Okay, am I, am I okay now? Good. Oof, technology. Distinguished excellencies, as I said, please allow me to stand on announced protocol given the limited time that I have. I'm grateful to my sisters, Commissioner Minata Samata Kasuma, and Assistant General, Assistant Secretary General Ahuma Esiakongwa for spearheading this virtual meeting. It is timely and we, we will make a difference in how we chart the way forward. Madam Assistant Secretary General, thank you for the presentation of the WGPP Action Plan, which has been enriched by discussions where it matters at the local level. It is always a pleasure and it re-energizes me to be with sisters who have demonstrated their commitment to the struggle for equality for women and the men who have joined us in that struggle. These are visionary men who are concerned about the future of the world and humanity, recognizing that we are in peril if we continue to do business as usual, particularly as we battle the COVID-19 virus. They have understood that transformative and beneficial change can only come with deep inflection on actually those who have benefited from historical advantage affirmative action and have been parachuted into positions. Certainly women have not had that over the years. The issues of governance and political participation are very close to each and every one of us who are participating in this meeting today. We have listened to many speakers on the first day Today, with your permission, I'll make my remarks short and somewhat personal. Some of you are familiar with my story, but I hope that the telling of a few parts of it will help to encourage many of you that are here today and beyond those who are here to continue your efforts to reach leadership levels or to support others who will need your help to do so. Let me say that some of the ways in which sisterly solidarity can encourage one. I was making my first trip to the African Union Heads of Authority meeting. It was the first time they would have a woman colleague. And as you can know, I was a little nervous about the reception, how I might be received, how I would be able to cope. As I came closer to the hall, I saw a crowd of women they surrounded me and drums began to beat. The women sang me to my seat and my, use, my courage returned and enabled me to sit and get to the business at hand. I know now it was Binata Dio who organized this and with former head of our AU Commission, former president of the commission, 
and Mzuma, who granted her the support to do so. That's the kind of sisterhood which may be symbolic, but which can make a big difference when women are approaching a position in which they've never had before, but they need that courage with all the competence they may have, that courage to proceed and to take over. I also know that I would not have been elected as the first female president in Africa without women at my side and behind me. My country had been torn apart by a brutal war and the future looked bleak. The women traders, market women as we call them, decided that they and their families had had enough and they wanted peace and a leader who cared about them and their children, one who knew what it was to be a woman, to have children to care for. They also knew that if they, if they elected me and stood with me, that they could trust me. They could trust me to seek their welfare. And so I would say to all my sisters out there, if you want to reach the top leadership levels, please make sure not only that you have a clear vision of purpose, but also reach out in such a way that you are dependable and predictable. Perhaps you may not always be predictable because there are times when you may have to, to make changes in what you, you want to do but always please be dependable by your different, as you interact and support your sisters. Sometimes one may never know how much they are encouraged, how much they pursue their joining with the kind of self-confidence that you pass on to them by what you do in what you say. My journey to the presidency was long, sometimes dangerous. I was jailed twice, almost killed certain times. So my second message is that we should not want any other woman to sacrifice in this way the toll on oneself is very heavy and on our families even worse. If other women are not to suffer in this way, we all need to commit today to support women who are seeking leadership roles in the public, private, and peace and security sectors. We have to act like the Liberian market women and be a buffer, as well as a propelling force which overwhelms all obstacles in our sister's way. My third message is that we have focused for decades on integrating into the amorphous mainstream and on improving ourselves through training and capacity building. However, if this was a conversation about racism, we would understand that it's not women who must change. It is those men who cling to the old ways and attitudes and propagate negative perceptions of women in leadership. Many have not understood, like the many men who have worked with us as partners, like those in the system, those who are with us today, who know that a partner with women their commitment to a change in a way poverty shared can only exercise and benefit 
society, including themselves. We have not been the agents of our systemic discrimination and historical disadvantage. And why we should not be asked to dismantle structures and systems in which we had no hand in building, we must be a part with their support and collaboration in trying to ensure that they are removed for the benefit of all. This is one of the reasons why, although I should, I cannot retire. I'm compelled to join hands with you to promote and support more women into leadership positions. Yeah. The, the EJS Center for Women's Leadership and Development was launched early this year and it's on its way. Today we have 14 women who have advanced on their leadership journey. We are very pleased that three of them, Dr. Sanato Ajuma Rawlings, a member of parliament in Ghana, Ms. Yupendo, Dr. Uh, Yupendo Yuhara Penesa, uh, Eva spoke about her at Lend, uh, also a member of parliament from Tanzania, and Ms. Yvonne Akisoya, the mayor of Freetown, Sierra Leone. All three were invited to the forum. Two of them spoke yesterday, and I think you will agree with me as the Assistant uh, Secretary General has done so about how they all are well set to be great leaders. So my commitment like yours to women empowerment and leadership is rooted in our joinings. Together, we must hold as many women's hands up as we can. Our mission is clear, our commitment is strong, and our journey is irreversible. We hope that so many of us, that all men and women equally committed will join us in this march toward achieving the goals that women have sought. I believe it is not too far in the future when we will not longer have to identify one woman's success here or is success there, but to recognize multiple women leaders in positions all over the world as a normal occurrence in every nation in the body politic. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you so much, Excellency, for sharing a little bit of your journey uh, to where you are, and especially when you said that nobody really understands or knows what one sign of kinship, sisterhood, and support could lend to another woman's journey um, in leadership as the women led by Madame Pineta Diop um, and the, 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 the former uh, chair of the commission introduced and supported you in your debut um, appearance here at the African Union Commission as, as head of state. And as we go on with our journeys, as we look to others who went before us, I think um, one of the women who is certainly the the, pull, uh, the, 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 the the basically holding the banner for women leadership today as it looks like and how we would like to see it in the future is the current president of the Federal Republic of Ethiopia, Madame Sahlewok Zerede. Thank you very much for joining us and we look very much forward to your words of welcome and your keynote speech. I think I'm done. Thank you very much, Eva. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, more than, I'm really honored to be part uh, of the launching of the African Women Leaders Network's governance pillar. Today, through the action plan, women in governance and political participation, enhancing African women's role in leadership. Let me start by really 
warmly congratulating and recognizing my two sisters, Commissioner Minata Samate and ASG Ahuna Iziakonwa for spearheading these efforts. I also like to recognize the leadership of the chairperson of the African Union Commission, my brother Musafaki Muhammad, and that of my dear sister, the UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Muhammad. Their commitment and dedication to the empowerment of African women is indeed a key driver. I've been with Aulin since its creation. I therefore remain committed to the empowerment of women and support the efforts to unite the African continent around an action plan that includes women, not only in COVID response, but also in governance and politics. We're meeting via video conference today due to the coronavirus pandemic. It is therefore fitting that the launch be centered around the COVID-19 and its impact on women, precisely leveraging women leadership in the COVID-19 response and beyond. Advocacy for women in power and decision-making has not started today, but a quarter of a century ago with the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. We have the DSGs, which calls for women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making in political, economic, and public life. And 2030 is just around the corner. Although we've made significant strides, women have not yet bridged the gap. This is noticeable in many of our decision-making forums. Some nations are surely doing better than others, but globally, gender inequality persists. And this is precisely what we need to work harder and more strategically to rectify the structures that prevent women from achieving leadership positions. 25 years ago, after Beijing declaration, women are still fighting to get into rooms where decisions are made. And when we enter these rooms, we're often the first in history. This is personal to me, as it has been to the few female presidents on the continent that, has, that the continent has produced. And we have heard the very good example of President Johnson Sirleaf. Being currently the only female president in Africa is not good enough. In fact, we're not moving. As I have said repeatedly, when a door of opportunity opens for a woman, besides fulfilling what, fulfilling what is expected from her, she needs to keep the door open, wide open, so that other women are allowed to pass through. And she needs all our support for that. The few of us who had the privilege cannot and should not be the tree hiding the forest. And when we get opportunities like this, we must be strategic on how we leverage this opportunity when we are in the rooms where decisions are made to ensure we're devising and promoting policies that empower the next generation of women leaders. We must be the voice for the voiceless and shine a light on the issues affecting women, including their safety and security. A woman's economic empowerment, as you all know, and as it has been said, is closely linked to her access to information and leadership in her community. As a woman gains more access to final financial resources and legal frameworks are revised to accommodate her existing challenges, we see a shift in her economic participation. I am hopeful that this action plan will generate greater technical and financial support for women's leadership across Africa, building on the gains of the past few years. As I see it, although there is a lot to be done in terms of legislation and legal, legal frameworks, the main shortcoming is the implementation of what we already have at the national, regional, and global levels. What come in short supply, unfortunately, are coordination and implementation. We need to redouble our efforts and have an ambitious target in putting in place that all in national chapters are in all our member states. 
COVID-19 was said to not discriminate in, in choosing its victims. But from what we are witnessing so far, its impact is affecting some more than other sections of societies. Our fragile gains can easily regress. Allow me to share my country's recent efforts in empowering women for leadership. Today in Ethiopia, there is a gender parity in the cabinet. Women have been appointed to key leadership, leadership positions, such as mine, Chief Justice, um, Attorney General, Chairperson of the National Election Board. Additionally, women in, in, in the parliament are nearing 40%, but uh, I think we should do more after the next elections. I'm here with you today to reemphasize our shared goal of gender equality and women's leadership. For these goals to be achieved across the continent, it will be important to capitalize on the progress made here in Ethiopia, particularly the attempt that we have in creating space for the leadership of women. By the way, um, many task force and committees that has been set up uh, since the pandemic are led by our uh, women ministers. This initiative launched under the theme, leveraging the role of African women, the response of COVID-19 is timely as the world grapples with the fallout of the coronavirus outbreak. It is important for African countries to look for coordinated, comprehensive, inclusive and proactive responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. The immediate and long-term consequences of the coronavirus pandemic is disproportionately impacting the lives of women and girls. Women are on the front line of this crisis with up to 70% of health workers globally being women. Here in Ethiopia, we have around 40,000 female health extension workers, which are really dispatched all over the country, uh, doing a great job in, in uh, creating awareness around this virus. And all of them, nearly all of them are women. The COVID-19 pandemic and some of the measures to contain it are putting women's lives and safety at risk. Violence against women is increasing with thousands of women suffering within the confines of their homes. Living in confinement and in times of economic stress can increase the risk of sexual exploitation and violence against women. Failing to consider gender dimensions in the response to the pandemic will not only exacerbate existing inequalities, but also create new ones. So what solutions can the African Women Leaders Network bring to address the differential impact of the pandemic on women and men, boys and girls? Allow me to share with you a few ideas and I'll be quick on that. Advocacy for women's participation and leadership in executive and parliamentary decision-making on COVID-19. Advocate for women in the informal sector, and there are many of them, to be included in the legislation and frameworks of the response to the virus. Support to overseeing the government uh, action on the pandemic from a gender perspective. All decision-making processes and agenda settings on priorities in the fight and recovery from COVID-19 should automatically involve women. Invest in timely, quality, reliable, and comparable data and statistics and facilitate evidence-based policy dialogue. It is important and in fact critical to focus on the hopefully short-term uh, presence of women uh, or in the COVID-19 response and their role in the task forces and committees. The mixing of the long-term legislative and appointive path should not make us short-sighted though. I'm not sure if you all have the opportunity to look at the document. As a living document, I think we should all be free to enrich it and update some of the data. But let me just mention one as I conclude. On the priority initiative, reduced discrimination and changed perception on women in leadership, 
which I think is a key action if women's leadership is to increase um, uh, and empower um, women to truly lead. I wonder how, though, in the absence of research, case studies of names and forms of discrimination, perception about women's leadership, one can wonder how one reduces discrimination and change perceptions. What materials are going to be used to train the media and engage um, thought leaders? Are we assuming that there are prior African-based knowledge on the types of discrimination and perception about women that could be used for training? I think I'm just provoking thoughts so that we, as we move on, as we implement and launch this document, we also enrich it. You can count on Ethiopia and on me personally to push this initiative forward. I encourage us all to make it a mandate for us to go beyond rhetoric and truly overcome the hurdles of women's participation in the decision-making sphere, in parliament, in ministries, in government, in rural communities, in private sector, and the highest offices of the land. Congratulations to all women for staying the course and impacting the world wherever you are, in Africa or in the diaspora. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency, and for those extremely inspirational words. And I suppose they are probably the most apt transition to the next part of our virtual forum this afternoon, which is the actual launch of the Women, Governance and Political Participation Initiative, which is going to be launched by I suppose the natural choice, but certainly by deed and by personal conviction, um, part of the reason why I'm sitting in front of you today, and certainly uh, more than half of the cabinet of his cabinet, um, he chose and decided will and are women. Um, this I'm obviously talking about my boss, um, Honorable Musa Faki Mahamad, who is not only my boss, but probably also my older sister in many ways, as much as he is my older brother um, and, and protector and making sure that not only are women in the room, but they are amongst the leading voices that are to be heard in that room where he serves and where he leads. And I'm sure many of you here today will be able to attest not only to his shared commitment to our to our presence here, but also making sure that our presence becomes an institutional reality by making sure that the commission also works towards the gender parity of 50-50 um, in the next three years. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, it's my utmost honor um, to introduce to you uh, the chairperson of the African Union Commission, Musa Faki Mahamad, who more than most knows that the future is indeed female because he leads it. Thank you, Eba. Excellence uh, Sariol, President de la République fédérale démocratique d'Éthiopie, Madame Erlen Serlif, ancienne présidente de la République de Libéria, Excellence Amina Mohamed, secrétaire générale adjointe des Nations Unies, Madame la commissaire Minata Sesuma, Mesdames et Messieurs, chères sœurs, Une fois de plus, vous me faites l'honneur et le privilège de m'associer à vos activités en prenant part au lancement de l'initiative conjointe Union africaine Nations Unies sur les femmes dans la gouvernance et leur participation politique. Renforcer le rôle des femmes africaines dans le leadership et tirer parti de ce leadership dans la réponse contre le COVID-19. Cette initiative est un éclatant témoignage de notre engagement commun à renforcer le leadership des femmes africaines en vue de la réalisation des aspirations de notre double référentiel, l'agenda africain 2063 et l'agenda 2030 des Nations Unies. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers sœurs, L'égalité des sexes, la parité, la participation effective des femmes aux prises des décisions 
et l'autonomisation pleine et entière de celles-ci sont inscrites en lettres d'or dans tous nos instruments politiques, juridiques et éthiques. La proclamation de l'inclusion de tous les citoyens dans les institutions et les processus démocratiques vise en premier lieu les femmes et les jeunes. Il est à cet égard heureux de constater que les politiques et les programmes ciblant la participation, la représentation et le leadership des femmes et la réduction des inégalités entre les sexes ont pris de l'envergure au fil des ans dans de nombreux pays. Il y a cependant, malgré ces progrès notoires, des larges zones d'ombre où les avancées des femmes trébuchent encore. Il en sera toujours ainsi, tant que les femmes n'auront pas assumé le rôle de leader, au-delà des symboles, dans tous les aspects de la gouvernance, en tête desquels le champ politique et les centres de décision stratégique au niveau national et à l'échelle internationale. La gouvernance nationale et la gouvernance internationale attestent ici d'une intime interdépendance et obéissent à une extraordinaire grammaire. Les Nations Unies et l'Union africaine ont encore ici des vastes champs à défricher, à labourer avant de cueillir les palmarès dont nous rêvons tous pour les femmes partout dans le monde. L'initiative sur les femmes dans la gouvernance et leur participation politique qui nous réunit aujourd'hui consacre une analyse des systèmes de gouvernance qui soulignent des déficiences patentes au désavantage des centaines de millions de femmes, particulièrement en Afrique. Le point lumineux de nos assises réside dans l'espoir qu'elles mettront en évidence des expériences féminines à travers des bonnes pratiques pour surmonter les obstacles à une participation effective en politique et dans tous les secteurs publics et privés. J'appelle les États membres de l'Union africaine à la soutenir et à garantir la mise en œuvre effective du plan d'action proposé pour la gouvernance et la participation politique des femmes afin qu'elles puissent amplifier leur voix, leur pouvoir et leur influence dans les processus décisionnels. Le lancement de l'initiative conjointe UA-ONU arrive à un point nommé. Elle intervient au pic d'urgence de notre stratégie continentale de riposte et de résistance à la grave crise sanitaire de la COVID-19. La pandémie du COVID-19 n'est pas, pas seulement un défi pour les systèmes de santé, mais aussi un test de notre engagement en faveur de l'égalité du genre et de l'autonomisation des femmes. Il est aujourd'hui établi que les femmes jouent un rôle plus profondément dans la prise en charge de la maladie dans nos communautés. Je pense en particulier à toutes celles qui œuvrent dans le domaine de la santé, notamment ces médecins, ces infirmières, ces aides-soignantes, ces femmes des salles qui prennent des risques quotidiens pour sauver des vies. Le drame, voire l'injustice humaine, apparaissent ici lorsque nous observons malheureusement à une grande échelle l'augmentation des violences contre les femmes. L'urgence de promouvoir les politiques et mesures dissuasives par la sanction et l'éducation ne nous laisse guère d'excuses pour ne pas agir et agir vite contre ces fléaux que la COVID-19 a amplifiés. Mesdames et messieurs, chers sœurs, l'initiative que nous avons l'honneur aujourd'hui de lancer avec les Nations unies amène à réfléchir sur certaines priorités qu'il convient d'inclure dans le plan d'action. D'abord, les plaidoyers pour l'amplification de la participation des femmes et l'intensification de leur leadership dans la gouvernance et dans la formulation des stratégies de riposte à la COVID-19 et à tous les niveaux. La lutte contre les conséquences néfastes de la pandémie qui fragilise les femmes et les filles il est urgent de les protéger contre la violence sexuelle et sexiste pendant la crise. 
la mise en œuvre des programmes à impact rapide pour atténuer les effets négatifs de la pandémie sur les femmes et particulièrement les groupes de femmes défavorisés et vulnérables, tels que les personnes âgées, les femmes enceintes et les filles avec un handicap, les migrants, les déplacés internes, les réfugiés et les femmes privées de liberté. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, la participation des femmes au processus de prise de décision et au leadership fait partie de la lutte des femmes depuis la déclaration et le programme d'action de Beijing. Aujourd'hui, 25 ans après Beijing, faisons en sorte que la participation des femmes au processus de prise de décision et au leadership en Afrique soit une réalité. Une seule femme chef d'État en Afrique n'est pas acceptable du tout. Ce n'est pas acceptable du tout. Ce n'est pas juste, ce n'est pas démocratique et c'est intolérable. La question du genre n'est plus une question théorique. C'est du concret que les femmes ont besoin. Votre initiative ne saurait décevoir l'immense espérance placée en elle, placée en vous, présente aujourd'hui en ligne avec nous. La Commission de l'Union africaine est pleinement engagée à vos côtés. Guidez-nous, conseillez-nous, prenez, prenez nos mains vers le bien pour vous. Nous savons qu'il est aussi le nôtre, c'est de l'humanité tout entière. Là où les femmes sont, la volonté de Dieu y est. Chères sœurs, laissez-moi finir par exprimer ma sincère fierté de ce que vous faites pour le continent africain, de ce que vous faites pour les peuples africains, de ce que vous faites pour les femmes africaines dont vous êtes des modèles. C'est pour moi un plaisir et je me répète un honneur d'assister à cette réunion où des femmes africains leaders de tous les âges, de Hélène Serlif à Aya Chabi, qui, dans une, commission, dans une communion totale, se battent pour l'Afrique que nous voulons, où la femme joue et jouera le rôle des piliers de la société. Tous mes respects, je vous remercie. Thank you so very much, sir, um, for your for your leadership, for your for your empathy, and for your commitment to be where you are, leading us with you. And thank you very much for putting that small little piece of um, that plaque, which says exactly what we feel that the future is indeed female. And as we open, as we continue with the launch of this initiative, I must add that it is by depth of um, of absolute serendipity that the person who gave that plaque to Musafaki Muhammad is none other than the next speaker, the United Nations Deputy Secretary General, Amina Muhammad, who is not just a leader, um, but truly um, a role model who makes it look so easy with her wry humor, her unblinking, but very, very, very serious stare that when she talks, she means it and she will not let you go until you not only get what she said, but that you do, as she says. <laughs> it is my extreme honor to be able to, uh, to introduce to you. <laughs> Thank you so very much for joining us for the launch of this. And I'll give you the floor now. And thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you very much, um, Your Excellency, my big brother, Musa Faki Muhammad, the chairperson of the African Union Commission. Let me just say he took the sign from my desk, which means that um, I didn't have to make him believe in that. He took it. The only thing I would add to that sign is the future um, is women, but now. Your Excellency, uh, Madam Sally Wokizwede, the president of the Federal Dep Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, Your Excellency, Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, our former president of Liberia and patron of the African Women Leaders Network, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear sisters. 
It is indeed my pleasure and honor to join you today to launch this important virtual African Union United Nations Initiative on Women in Governments and Political Participation. And I really do feel the energy and would like to acknowledge the other 146 women in the room um, and of course uh, outside of the Zoom room. I'd like to begin by congratulating our Chief Feminist, His Excellency Musa Faki Mohammed, and the African Union Commission on its efforts not only to ensure gender parity, but empowering that leadership in the African Union. I also recognize the role of member states and our partners. I would like to congratulate my sisters, Commissioner Minata Samate Susuma of the AU Department of Political Affairs and ASG Ahuna Ezekwana from UNDP for helping to advance women's participation in governance structures and political processes across Africa. And Minata, you finally did it. I have to tell you that she has pursued this meeting for many, many, many months. I'd like to commend also my sisters, the AU Special Envoy for Women, Peace and Security, Binta Diop, and the UN Women Executive Director, uh, Pumzili Mlambo Nguka for their consistent efforts to strengthen African Women Leaders Network since the creation in 2017. They've been dogged about it and we're here because um, they have said so. Their vision is the foundation of the initiative we're launching today. Um, I'd like to also proudly acknowledge the leadership of our AU Youth Envoy, Aya Chebi. Not an easy task, but you are demonstrating that young people can take the helm of affairs today. Last but not least, my deep appreciation for the partnership and the unwavering support of the government of Germany. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in unprecedented times. COVID-19 has exposed and it's exacerbated existing gaps and inequalities. It has severely impacted physical and mental health. It's widened socioeconomic divides. It's threatened fundamental freedoms and human rights, and it has reduced access to life-saving humanitarian aid. The global recession that is widely forecast could reverse Africa's progress towards achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and more importantly, the AU's Agenda for 2063. It will have a disproportionate and devastating effect on women and girls. At the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic is highlighting the effectiveness of women's leadership. Around the world, women leaders at all levels are being hailed for their ambition, their understanding of the complexities of this human crisis, and their decisiveness in the face of difficult choices. The Women Rise for All initiative that was launched by the UN last month is giving visibility to women leaders, highlighting their contributions in the global response to COVID-19, while hanging on and sustaining the gains of the 2030 Agenda. African women are on the front lines and they are excelling as heads of state. Today, we've been inspired and continue to be uh, see the demonstration in the unique manner in which President Wokezwede actually leads. We also stand on the shoulders of our President Sirleaf. We have ministers, business leaders, health and care workers, as community leaders, peace builders and mobilizers. We truly are on the front lines. Women's leadership is bringing different experiences. It's bringing different perspectives and more important, different capabilities. Diversity, inclusivity, and gender equality are all essential to achieving our goals for peace, human rights, and sustainable development. Excellencies, sisters, it is against this background of the action plan we are launching today that will enhance women's role in governance leadership and the response in COVID-19, a very real reality. We must seize this opportunity to end persistent exclusion and begin a full and equal partnership between men and women in decision-making and leading. The African Women Leaders Network is such a partnership. It, in its nascent state, it has already established more than 25 national chapters linking women across countries and at all levels. Last year, Aulin launched a fund with UNECA investing in women entrepreneurs to ensure that women have the capital to innovate and to succeed. While it is true that the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 are particularly acute for women, this crisis is also presenting us with an opportunity to reshape the world and to rebuild back better and stronger. It is also a time for us to invest in our youth and to begin a genuine intergenerational transition in earnest. As we address the pandemic, many countries have adopted or will soon adopt 
fiscal stimulus packages to respond to the COVID-19 packages that already amount to at least $8 trillion. To build back stronger, these packages must target women, putting immediate cash transfers to women and adopting measures that will support women's employment, access to income and expanded social protection systems. We must also ensure that we maintain the essential health and education services, including maternal and sexual and reproduction health. And we must protect from rising GBV in all its forms, including FGM. Now is also the time to leverage the visibility on women's leadership and push for greater representation and political life at all levels. As the speakers before me have said, it is unacceptable that we only have one president on the continent. We are not gaining from the other 50% capacity that we have to lead. Achieving this will take a variety of measures. It will include the use of quotas and temporary special measures, accountability for political parties for equal representation, and dedicated funds established at the country level to invest in young women at the start of their political careers. We must also address the persistent violence perpetrated against women in political life. This is a trend we are seeing across all our countries. Women are targeted as voters, candidates, and elected officials. They are exponentially more likely to be targeted for abuse and bullying online and also on social media, but tragically in real life. <clears throat> this violence is intended to scare women, to enforce inequality, and to deny them their fundamental right to lead. Dismantling the obstacles to women's equal representation and political life will take a comprehensive and a multi-pronged approach, but it's necessary and now is more than the time. When we deny women an equal place in political life, we're denying societies much more effective, responsive and credible institutions and decision-making. This was a promise of the Beijing Platform for Action 25 years ago, and it remains as important today. I invite all member states and friends of Aulin to show their commitment to an unfinished business of gender equality by providing sustainable and flexible funding for the action plan that we are launching today. We must take it off the shelf. And as President Sally said, this is a live document. Continue to enrich it, to shape it, but to, to water it, to fund it, to ensure that it takes root and it is able to thrive and fry, survive for us. This initiative and action plan have the potential to significantly change the landscape of African politics. Regional economic communities and national chapters of the African Women's Leadership Network will have an important role to play, and I urge their full engagement and commitment. I'm calling on all of us here today to embrace the opportunity. Let's contribute to more gender responsive and equitable recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. Let's build back stronger societies that are inclusive, that are young, that are resilient, and that are focused on our common humanity. If we do this together in sisterhood with the courage of our convictions, the future will indeed be female, but it will also be now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, honorables. Unfortunately, Eba has had to step away. So I'd just like to say, uh, Your Excellency, Mrs. Asala Zode, President. Sorry, could I, I would like to gate crash. Um, happy birthday, Musa Mohammed Faki. Big day. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday. God bless and may, <laughs> may you live healthy with wisdom in the future years to come. Thank you so much, Madam. Um, on behalf of, of the team, we would like to thank the, the panel, your excellencies uh, for the time that you have taken. I know uh, we've run a little bit ahead of time, but your words have been very inspirational for women leaders at all levels. We have been encouraged, we have been inspired, and now is the time for action. The message is clear. It starts with us and all of us together. So on behalf of, of, the, of the organizers, I'd just like to thank uh, the president, uh, Zelda. Thank you, Mrs. Ellen Johnson. Thank you, Chairperson, and happy birthday. Uh, thank you for reminding us of that, uh, Deputy Secretary General, and also very much congratulate uh, Mrs. Minata Susuma and Ms. Ahuna Ziakonwa for this 
occasion. And with that, I would like to thank the panel and we would like to move on to the next session, which is a very exciting panel discussion on the experiences of young women leaders. I think it's been very clear that this is about us and it starts from the, the root. It starts from the opening the door and keeping the door open for these young women leaders. And at this point, I would like to invite the moderator for this session, who is Her Excellency Professor Sarah Agbor to, to come to the floor, as well as the three panelists. Uh, we're very happy to have you, um, AU Youth Envoy, Aya Chebi, we have a physician, public health researcher uh, representing the Aulan Young Women Leaders Caucus, Dr. Joni Bewa, as well as a CSO representative and co-founder of Yaga in Africa from Nigeria, Cynthia Bamalu. Welcome. And over to you, Madam Agbor. Professor, you have the floor. As Professor comes to the floor, there we have her. Welcome, Professor. <laughs> Sorry about that technology again and again. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am not seeing Aya Shebi. I am here, Commissioner. Okay. And do we have the representative of, um, of the African Women Leaders Network, Young Women Leaders Caucus, Dr. Joanne Bewo? Yes, I'm here, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Since we are transiting, it's been interesting listening to the distinguished and esteemed excellencies share their experience and speak to us. And now we are coming to the very, the most important part for me, because the youth of Africa are the future, like everybody has said when they were speaking. And uh, it is very important that we realize that we're playing a role together. Um, the title of our panel is Lessons and Experience from Young Leaders on Leading During Crisis Contexts, such as COVID-19 and beyond, how young people are leading and influencing decision makings and policy implementations. I do not know how many minutes we have. Since we're supposed to stop at 4.30, I would like to know how many minutes we have so that we can okay. tune ourselves. If we can keep it to 25 minutes, that would help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So in that wise, I will first call on, on the African Union Youth Envoy, Ms. Aya Shabi, to introduce herself. Thank you Aya. very much, Commissioner. You. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, my mentor and the one I come to with sometimes excitement, many times frustration, but who will always give me guidance. Uh, it was really inspiring to listen to all the It's like a feminist audience. So I would just say all the calls are. Uh, and I want to apologize in advance. I'm very challenged that's today. I hope I can be able to cover um, before power goes off. I think uh, it's really an initiative and, and also congressional commission on political affairs, UNDP region for our in kinders. Um, and I want to also recognize young women in Africa, the credible and the fights that have been working on the front line as health workers in civil society, producing hand sanitizers, masks. Uh, distributing door-to-door -to -door crowdfunding. It's most vulnerable. Oh. Aya, your son is not very good. Your son is not very good. You have technical problems. 
Are you in the office? Oh, young Grace. Why we are waiting for you to work on your technical? Uh, can you speak now? We can't. We can't. We can't hear you. You are not audible. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Um, so I was uh, just recognizing the, the work and effort of, of young women um, who are at the forefront of the response to COVID-19. And just to mention a few examples. So I was just uh, asking you to introduce yourself first, you as a person. I have not yet asked you to speak on the efforts of young people. Oh, okay, um, Commissioner, <laughs> my name is Aya. I'm the African Union Youth Envoy. <laughs> okay. Dr. Joanne Bewa, please could you introduce yourself? Yes, Commissioner. I'm Joanne Bewa. I'm a passionate advocate for gender equality and health, uh, but I'm also uh, a medical doctor working, you know, at the intersection of uh, family medicine, but also reproductive health. Very and important. Here, I'm with very the Allen Young Women Caucus. Thank you very much. Your um, your, your your designation is very important to the conversation we're going to have here, and. Um, we, we know that it is very important for us to introspect and retrospect on the journey so far. After the 72 years of the uh, Universal Declaration and Plan of Action that are enshrined in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa. That is the Maputo pro, uh, Protocol. And now the vision of the African Union um, Department of um, Political Affairs in collaboration with UNDP is to work the talk on how to get more women involved in development as well as catalyze action on related legal, national, regional, and global uh, relevant legal policies and frameworks. Now, in the light of COVID-19, and you're a medical doctor, in the light of COVID-19, women need to get on board to catalyze action. And I know that the youth of Africa have really, really gotten on, bo uh, on board. In this wise, I would really like to thank my Ms. Aya Shebi for her leadership, which is focused on visionary. Now, the question I'm going to ask Ms. Aya, Aya is that as the youth envoy of the African Union Commission, can you share some of the lessons and experiences as a young leader leading during this time of crisis from a continental perspective? Aya. Um, I was asked the same question, Dr. Joanne Bewa. I will call you Joanne. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I do not. I do not, okay. Excellency. Okay, my sister. Uh, okay, as a young leader, a medical doctor, in the crisis, in this COVID crisis, as well as in, uh, as a member of the AWLN Young Women Leaders Caucus, can you share with us um, your experience? as a leader leading during this crisis in the light of COVID-19, and even from the perspective of a medical doctor, what are the experiences gained? What are the lessons learned? Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Uh, please allow me to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, President uh, Sally Wogzwede, uh, Madam Amina Mohamed, Madam Fungzile, Madam Auna, uh, but our he for she, um, Chairperson Musafaki, Commissioner Minata uh, Sesuma, but also uh, Madam Bineta Diop, one of our co convener who also have been keeping the doors open for young women. And I won't want to forget my sister, Ayashebi, which I, with whom I have the honor to collaborate on a couple of initiatives. And you, our, uh, Madam Commissioner, for moderating this panel. Um, I would like to, first of all, highlight the fact that COVID has disrupted almost all aspects uh, of life, including economic, social, political, but it's also worsened and deepened inequalities, talking about gender inequalities, social, but also economic. But I also think that COVID-19 is also an opportunity for us as individual communities and institutions to rethink our priorities to reinforce our commitment, but also stop business as usual, because we need to realize that health, gender, social development are equally as important as politics, military, and development. 
And if I may share my personal experience with, with healthcare, I came to the field of medicine and decided to serve as a medical doctor in my country of origin, Benin Republic, and engage later on on public health because at nine years old, I almost lost my life due to a fragile health. As you know, women represent over 70% of healthcare workers globally. So imagine if women and men who provided me care that day when I was nine years old were not equipped, were not trained, were not skilled uh, by programming place in Benin, I would probably not have been here today to share my experience. So just to reposition how critical it is for us to rethink our priority. But to answer your question and related to the work that the Allen Young Women Caucus has been championing so far, I want to realize, highlight that the Allen Young Women Caucus is the sixth pillar uh, of the Allen Network with membership all over the continent. We are known for our vibrant network of young women and highly skilled professionals championing in politics, science, civil society, governance, media, name it. But we're also known for organizing, uh, co-organizing the first intergenerational leadership retreat last year in Kenya with over 200 participants. I want to make a bold statement. Uh, the future is female, but the present is young and female. That's why hearing best practices and lessons from young women championing COVID and beyond COVID is really critical. We, we've seen young people from the caucus, but also outside of the caucus, partnering with the AU Femboy and other network to lead consultations on how young people are affected by COVID. We know that one out of six young people are out of work due to COVID. And we are not talking about those who are already unemployed. We also see that this crisis is hitting young women and young women harder and faster than any other group. And taxes and financial support that are provided do not necessarily focus on young women. So young women and youth has been involved from youth advocacy, uh, from engaging community outreach in terms of risk communication, contact tracing, active surveillance, but also working on data and providing care as medical doctor, nurses in community. However, where we lack meaningful engagement of young people is engagement in high leadership or task force that has been set up in a couple of countries originally. Where we lack meaningful engagement of young people is also funding decision making about COVID, both decision making and access to funding to lead initiatives. Just to give you one example, Madam Commissioner, there are inspiring leaders that we all respect and that we all admire and who are currently advising and supporting the COVID response globally and regionally. But I and the caucus would like to see some of our young women professional qualified also play this role. That's why we believe in intergenerational co-leadership. That's why we think you should try us because we want to hold not just leadership position, but we also want to serve our people through those leadership positions. So appoint us, see us work, collaborate with you, and you will not regret. In terms of specific lesson learned from the COVID pandemic, but also women's engagement in governance beyond the pandemic, because we need to have a, a plan, a plan B or a plan Z in terms of recovery, in terms of rebuilding and rethinking the world. One uh, lesson learned or best practices that I personally realized in that couple of the consultation that the Aulin Young Women Leaders Network, Young Women Caucus highlighted is that the best emergency plan is the everyday plan which is able to surge during a crisis. The best emergency system or plan is the everyday or the routine system or plan which is effective and can surge into a crisis, which means engaging young women, strengthening health system, investing in health systems before pandemic are crucial and critical. The second element that I want to highlight that the intergenerational retreat organized last year also pointed out is, it is important to train women 
It is important to mentor women. It is critical to recruit women, but it is even more important to retain women in the leadership and governance position. And in talking about this four-step approach of training, mentoring, recruiting, and retaining, I think we have had some bold and strong commitment uh, from the AU and UN level uh, to mentor young women, and we are actively working uh, and make that happen. And, and last, so can, last but not the least, just before you conclude, I just wanted to remind the professor that there's one more panelist who's who's also waiting to, to come in. That's uh, Cynthia Bamalu. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. And to conclude and, and make sure that this panel is really dynamic and, and bring in a, a lot of diversity and, and opinion. I, in terms of specific recommendation, I want to borrow from the Women in Global Health five asks. Those five asks not just give recommendation for engaging and strengthening women participation in global health, but can also be expanding across all spectrum of leadership and governance. The first ask is about equal representation, equality, but also equity, making sure that not just we recruit for equal representation, but we retain young women in the workplace. The second ask is about safe and decent work. I know the excellencies who preceded me focused on harmful practices and any type of non-enabling environment that can impede and affect young women participation. The third ask is fair pay and shared unpaid work. The fourth one is gender responsive approach. Gender responsive approach from bottom to top, gender responsive approach across all planning level. And the last but not the least, and I'm sure my sister Aya will call me on that, well-funded organization. Youth work is professional work because we have young professional women who are expert, who are skilled in the area of expertise. My area of expertise is, is medicine and public health and global health policy. Other women are into healthcare, law or policy. We need to make sure that there are well-funded support to youth work led by young women on the continent. And I want to conclude and say, you can definitely count on the leadership and the support of the uh, African Women Leaders Young Women Caucus, because we've said it, anything that is done without young women on the continent is done against us. And please try us because we want to co-lead with you. Thank you very much, Joanny. You've actually, I'm very proud that you're a woman and I'm very proud that you're a member of the AWL and Young Women Leaders Caucus. And like you said, when you were speaking, you said, appoint us, give us space, etc." I've seen that if you are given the space, you will change the world for the Africa we want. Thank you very much. And you, building on what you've said, I do not know if Aya is ready and if her, uh, if, if her technical problem hitches have been solved, Aya, I want to ask you to also share the lessons and experience that you as a young leader have faced during this crisis and the manner in which you've been able to galvanize youth across the continent to respond to COVID-19 in the different sectors that I know you have worked on, but I want you to be the one to say it. Can you hear me now, Commissioner? Yes, I can hear you, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I am very challenged with the internet, but thank you, Commissioner, uh, for your leadership and for the space to also share our experiences in, in this exciting panel. I wasn't able to hear my sister, uh, Joanne, but I'm sure she made a bold call uh, for, for young people. Um, I think from my side on the continental uh, level efforts, I'm extremely proud of the young women, um, incredible resilience and innovation in the fight against the pandemic. We convened 22 virtual AU youth uh, consultations uh, series the past three months, and it's incredible to see the work of young women and what they're doing on the front line, especially um, health workers, but also uh, young professionals and, and, and civil society actors. Um, but maybe just to, to, to paint the, the picture of reality in Africa and what young people, when we were trying to mobilize um, uh, a collective youth efforts on the continent, the response, they would always come back to ask for leadership, to ask for a seat at the table, to ask engaged um, in all levels of leadership. 
and, and the reality is we have a continent that is considered the world's youngest in the world, 65% under 35. But the disparity between the leadership and the population is challenging the very core of governance and sustainable development. It's the only region in the world where young people uh, or the population is increasing. It's estimated by 2050 that more than half of Africa's population will be under 25. Um, and that's why when we say, you know, the future is female, but we also say the future is young because the population is projected to be doubling in age, um, uh, in being younger. So I believe from, from just working with young people on the continent and, and the way that we're trying to mobilize on the Pan-African level, that there is a state of emergency of this gap. We need to examine leadership structures, the values, the traditional biases, the cultural shifts, because conflict on the continent is aggravated by this lack of communication and collaboration between generations. Young people are still invited to tables to speak and to participate, but they're not invited to the co-creation process, to the co-leadership space of governance. And until young people are part of the tough but needed process of co-designing the tables and the policies, it will be difficult for our generation to move forward and own an agenda that has been already set. We, we really have complex generational trauma and disconnection in Africa. We don't talk about it much, but we have a generation that fought independence, but the majority of African youth have no clue about Pan-Africanism. Uh, we did not study history of us as a continent. We did not study the history of female leadership. Uh, thank, thankfully, we have now role models like you, Commissioner, that we look up to, but we did not grow up on this. And, and we have a generation that build the African nation and the work of the AU and the UN as institutions in post-colonial Africa, which also majority of youth are still struggling to understand or to climb the ladder in the AU and the UN. And then we have our population, the millennials, the youthful population that is trying to navigate the world of a continued violence and inequality. And I really believe that we are at a tipping point. We need to start looking at generational collaboration as an approach for conflict prevention. And we have seen during the pandemic how much trust building and collaboration is needed between citizens and governments to beat the pandemic, to comply with the measures and lockdowns. But those citizens are 60% youth. So if you really want to beat the pandemic, you need to have the trust of those 60%. Um, and I think by helping to build a relationship of trust through dialogue and having youth in leadership, it will help our institution to be uh, to avoid being rejected by the youth or, or result in either violence or cycles of, of revolution. So I think for me, the most important um, moving forward and the lessons learned from this pandemic is that young people innovations need to be recognized. It needs to, to be certified. It needs to be documented. It needs to be part and parcel of national strategies. It's not about passing the torch or legacy to the next generation is about the wider possibility of the generational collaboration right now um, and, and learning from your wisdom and having youth innovation and digitalizing our African bureaucratic institutions. Um, and I would like to maybe conclude commissioner with few recommendations. I'm not sure if my internet will, will last, but on, on the 4th and 5th of May, my office uh, jointly convened with African Leadership Institute and with the support of uh, Public Service Division of Political Affairs Department, a workshop to discuss the inclusion of African youth in public service. And we brought together over 20 young policymakers and young ministers and public um, uh, servants. And they came up with four concrete ways to move forward on this um, you know, youth leadership in decision-making. One is lowering the age of entry of youth in public service. Many parliaments and presidential positions are still in the ceiling of 40s. So how can we have young women even run for office if they are not eligible? Can't we have a president at 32 years old like we did in the 60s? Um, can we you know, have young people who are really on leadership positions right now who, because, because they're competent, not because they are um, you know, based on their age, but really based on their competence. Two, building capacity for leadership through governance uh, internships. We need youth to occupy government corridors as paid interns. Young people want not only to have the opportunity to serve and lead, but also want to be enabled with the right tools and skills to navigate 
policy making space and also to navigate traditional frustrating bureaucratic institutions that we have three quotas quotas for youth in parliament and governance roles we know women in many countries succeeded to secure quotas but if youth don't have quotas young women are left out and for technical advisory roles for young people we see namibia's example with young brilliant sister as an advisor on youth to the president of namibia and because she delivered she has now a second term in her advisory role we need more of that and why not have a special envoy on youth across the continent for every president working with my office of the african union we need those advisory roles to make sure that we are speaking to our constituency from a youth perspective so uh, just to conclude commissioner i think my message really is to stimulate uh, solidarity between generation for all of us to move forward and take africa to where she deserves to be because africa is a female and a mother and that's why she's also resilient I, uh, you spoke you ended exactly the way Joanny uh, ended she said the future the the the, 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 um, the present is young and the future is female. And that is exactly your concluding um, um, uh, message that you've given us. We have another speaker. Her name is Miss Cynthia Mbamalu from Yaga, Nigeria. Miss Cynthia, are you on board? Yes. Um, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Cynthia. Can you introduce okay. yourself? Yes, thank you. And um, it's an honor to be on this panel. I'm Cynthia Mbamalu. I'm with the co-founder of Yaga Africa, and I am also a leader of the Not Young to Run movement, um, which is a movement committed to promote, promoting youth political inclusion in Nigeria and beyond, within the continent especially. And I'm glad um, to be speaking after Aya and also Joanny. I think, um, can, I, can I proceed? You can proceed. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'll just go in line with the conversations i am already had on this panel, and I'm glad we're having a session on youth I'm inclusion, especially looking from the angle of also young women. And this is because what was our reality before the COVID-19 conversations around our economic reality in the continent? We already had a rising level of unemployment. In security, you had um, a state of poor governance, go um, a government structure they were not meeting the needs of the people they were increasing violations of human rights and shrinking the shrinking civic space now these were our realities before covid-19 and within this context young people were major victims of the the, short, of the shortfalls of an ineffective system to meet the needs of the people and this was what we were living with before the pandemic now fast forward that to the pandemic now what did we have pandemic for, for each of these government response there was no intentional effort to have one a gender sensitive government response strategy and an inclusive strategy to ensure that the needs of young people were met so what we had were from the point of constitution of be it presidential task force or what have you, women and young persons were not included, even persons living with disability. So you see that the response strategy adopted by government did not address the needs of these special groups. And then you look at what started, what, what did we see? Part of, part of it is because the continent was not ready, government response strategy was not inclusive, young people were major, um, are feeling the major brunt of the pandemic, young women, because you also think about within the youth cohort, young women, one thing is you have two disadvantages. One, you're a young person and then you're a woman. So it's almost like you're struggling with two major disadvantages. Then if you're a young person with disability who is also a young woman, it's like three major disadvantages because one, you're a young person, you're a young woman, and then you're a young woman living with disability. So you see that in several approaches, be it in the introduction of economic stimulus packages and what have you, the youth voices were absent. So young people were not, you can't, um, were not benefiting from that process in the way that they should. And because of time, I will just go straight to how did young people respond? And, and I, I want to say, I want to commend young people within the continent because youth leadership actually took, and um, you could see the effect and impact of youth leadership within the continent. And I'll use an, um, examples from Nigeria also, considering that I'm working within, um, within the country. And what we have seen was one, youth became, young people became youth accountability vanguards. And talking with young people, work, I remember in the meeting, 
meeting with young people in both in Gambia, South Sudan. We saw young people who took leadership to demand accountability from their government. So in their response, young people started tracking how government was responsive, responsive to COVID and pushing out data on how COVID was impacting on, 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 on young people and even on women. We also saw young people pushing the campaign to fight misinformation and disinformation within the continent. But what were the things that we saw within, the, within Nigeria now? Before this period, the Not Young to Run movement, part of our success was we were in Nigeria, we were able to get young people elect, um, with the passage of the law, increase the number of young people who won elections and are currently in the legislative arm of government, also young women, even though within that we still had young, a few young women who emerged. But I, I know we already have, um, know the data. Now what we saw was one, our young legislators took leadership. So we had a cohort, cohort of young female legislators and what they were doing was reaching, of course, at the state level, at the local government level, the response wasn't really getting to them. They were not properly catered for. So these young female legislators went to their local government to provide beads and protective um, um, the PPEs, face masks, um, hand sanitizers. We also saw them responding to real ca um, cases, um, cases of sexual and gender-based violence. Now, if we didn't have, it was easier to reach out to the young female legislators, especially at the state level, because that was that was an entry point um, for, for young people working within the continent and uh, within the country. And then also at the national level, we had the Young Parliamentarians Forum, and we saw leadership with the demands or the, in, in the floor of the house. Now, one of the things we had seen with the COVID-19 was an increase in sexual and gender-based violence. Working with young females, we started the protest demanding for a state of emergency on gender-based violence in Nigeria. And part of our work was working with women in parliament to push for motion, actually drafting motions and getting female legislators to push for motions demanding for a state of emergency on sexual and gender-based violence. And now you see the campaign in Nigeria and the protest is real because the reality um, is, is, is the fact that gender and sexual based, um, sexual based violence increased during this period of COVID. Now, what do we need to do? How do we need to address this challenge? And what are we learning from, the, from COVID-19? Is that we've seen an evolving culture in civic activism, which I believe we need to invest in. Now, within the continent, the Africa, I will just take from the approach of the youth engagement strategy that we need to governments within the continent we need to start seeing young people as partners as beneficiaries and also as leaders because that is what is still missing in conversation around youth engagement so we may have an african youth charter we may have countries with national policies but implementation is still a major challenge we do not have implementation within countries in the continent now what else do we need to start looking at we need to review start a gender and youth audit of systems and processes within this period and especially as it affects the budget different governments had to review their budget to address the needs of the pandemic but very few countries are reviewing that through a gender lens and through a youth inclusive lens and that is what we need to start seeing government doing and such an um, such um so this can be a policy that, that that can be adopted adapted within different systems in especially as we are in the, we the, we're already mid-year most countries are planning for 2021 budget. We need to start seeing also budgeting to meet the needs of young people. Then also looking at economic policies. Now, what we have seen with COVID is that young people are major victims. We need to adapt economic policies that addresses demographic needs. Now, beyond the millennials, there's a special category, Generation Z. These are the ones going after the millennials. Yeah. Okay, so I will just share. Yes. Just 25 minutes. But I can see that all of you are bubbling. I'm seeing Miss Angela Lusigi already telling me my time is up. When I see her on the screen, I know that our time is up. But it is very, very interesting that I've had the three best speakers speaking. Mm -hmm. And I love your passion. I love your energy. And one thing that you have said is that youth, uh, young people feel the brunt of this pandemic, particularly the young girls. And the other thing that three of you have emphasized on is that young people are not invited in co-creation and that creates a complex generational trauma. And so we are using this opportunity to teach our leaders that please walk the talk, go beyond rhetoric, actually bring in the youth of Africa on the table and give them space to participate. I want to believe that many will be watching the three of you speaking 
will know that you are actually qualified because speaking the way you are speaking spontaneously but with accuracy and actually pinpointing on the problem makes me proud to be a woman and that I have my daughters who are taking over. I'm sure what our mother said, Her Excellency, Mrs. Ellen Johnson, that it is not only women who must change, but the men who inhibit the women to achieve individuality. There must be a paradigm shift on our patriarchal dealings. And I will tell you sincerely, even when, when you joined us, um, when, and when Joanne spoke, she, uh, she emphasized on five acts, equality, equity, safe and decent work, fair play, gender responsive approach, bottom up and well-funded organs. And you, Cynthia, you have said that budget through a gender lens and a youth lens. And that again also bridges in because I can see that all of you are speaking the same language with what I have said that when they had that workshop of the inclusion of youth in public service, they insisted on lowering the age of youth. The prime minister of Finland, she's 34 years old. Why can't we have a prime minister in our countries that are 34 years old, that are 32 years old? With competence, building capacity and skills, navigating traditional practices that inhibit youth and technical advisory roles in government. I want to see more youth ministers in the ministries of youth in the, in the gender, et cetera. And that brings us to the very idea of the chairperson of the African Union Commission when he spoke about the 1 million initiative, 1 million by 1021 initiative of four E's, the E of employment, the E of engagement, which is the co-creation and inclusivity that you are insisting on. The E of education, like Nelson Mandela said, only education can transform the world. And the E of entrepreneurship. Our girls have it, African girls can code. The future is female, the, the present is young. So there is need for us to coerce and make sure that everything works together for good for the Africa we want. I believe, like you have said, I'm, I'm echoing you, I'm your voice. Right now, I'm 19 years old. So I'm echoing your voice that if we need to move Africa, the Africa you know, agenda 26 period, that vision of an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa, driven by its own competent and skilled citizens, who are the youth of today? Because you will be our, our leaders. Then we must make sure that the youth actually come on board. Let's work the Thank talk so and move beyond rhetoric and actually give the young people space. So thank you very much for this thank opportunity. You so much. Opportunity you've given the youth of Africa to speak. And sincere honor and gratitude to all the excellencies who have spoken. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Agbor, and for that powerful panel. I, I want to thank all the panelists for their passion. They've really told us that we need to trust youth, we need to bet on youth, and we need to have that intergeneral collaboration. And also to use the tools that we have to expand the space for women, youth, and other disadvantaged communities uh, when it comes to the response. Thank you so much. Uh, we have. I would just like to re uh, recognize the presence of all the dignitaries who are with us. I know we have Dr. Pumzile Lambunguka, who's a uh, USG and UN Women Executive Director. We have Madame Binta Dup, the Special Envoy on uh, Women, Peace and Security. We also have several ministers and members of parliament, as well as honorable commissioners, representative of Aulan chapters and colleagues from the UN family. So thank you very much for, for staying with us through, through this discussion. We are now ready to go to the second panel discussion, which is about country experiences from leaders in public and private sector. Because we've talked a lot about making sure that we don't just look at political leadership in a vacuum. And to lead us into the discussion, it will be moderated by Ambassador Josefa Sacco, uh, who is with us from the African Union Commission. We will also have on the panel, uh, Ms. Ruzvito from UNECA, as well as Her Excellency Shirley Botre from Ghana. We also have Gideon Badagawa, who's a, from a private sector representative from Uganda, and always Ms. Jean Chiazzo from, um, who's a chair of Women in Maritime. So please, if you could come to the, to the floor and over to you, Ambassador. You have 30 minutes for this session, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to, to be the moderator of this important panel on uh, uh, countries' experience uh, from uh, leaders in the public and the private sector and uh, the proposal for accelerating the implementation 
of uh, legislation for advancing women's representation in governance and leadership. Excellencies, uh, members of the panel, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and participants on this panel. I will first of all uh, say that uh, after a very uh, interesting launch of the initiative on women governance and political uh, participation this afternoon, and the first session that I just you know, uh, participate at the end of the, the session, the first session on youth and how young people are leading and influencing decision making and policy implementation in uh, crisis context uh, of COVID-19 uh, that is currently ravaging, you know, all uh, uh, the world and affecting the social economic, you know, uh, development of our countries, livelihoods, all these uh, uh, environment is not really very conducive for you know for our our actions so with this and uh, i have the honor to be your moderator like i was already introduced my name is uh, joseph asako commissioner for agriculture rural uh, economy as well as environment i, I will just before giving the floor to my uh, distinguished uh, uh, panelists uh, I would just like to contextualize the actual uh, uh, issue of uh, the sustainable uh, development goal number five. I want to give a context of Africa where we are in terms of uh, leadership and in terms of uh, uh, our, our leadership uh, uh, program. So as we, we all know that uh, uh, the sustainable development goal number five calls for gender equality and the full empowerment of women and girls by 2030. Are we there? Do, are, do we have any key idea where we are in terms of country by country to achieve this, uh, the, this objective or this goal by 2030? We don't know. I don't know because I, I'm not really, you know, the, the mandate of gender per se is not on my department, so I cannot leverage progress in terms of achieving this, uh, this goal. We have only 10 years to go. Where are we? One of these targets is uh, the political empowerment of women. We are trying in our different uh, departments in terms of uh, African Union Commission. We are trying to look at all the program in the perspective, uh, gender perspective, whereby women have access, no leave, uh, leave no one behind. Let me admit that uh, we are gaining ground in, politi uh, in politics around the world. However, 25 years after Benjamin, women are still you know underrepresented across the level of uh, power in africa and we can admit it women represent almost half of the population on the continent 52 percent of uh, of the pop our population are women and yet they are the least uh, they are the least like uh, to all the political position and exercise authority across the continent so today on the continent we have only one woman president which is in the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Often, uh, female politicians in Africa overcome many barriers and constraints to access political position, but uh, they get little influence in decision-making uh, powers. The private sector is also the same, if not worse, in the private sector. This is the theme that we are going to discuss during this 30 minutes. Uh, there are, however, some good examples across, uh, across Africa. Let me start with the African Union Commission. Here, there is a gender parity. It's the only organization, you know, international multilateral organization that has the human parity in terms of uh, the, the, the leadership or the, the principles. At the national level, let me just share some uh, statistics. I know most of you are aware of it. We have women in the parliament, as at uh, 1st of January 2020, Rwanda has the highest proportion of parliamentarian in the world uh, at uh, 61%. Or oh, let's see, uh, 49 out of uh, 50 seats, 49 belongs to women. South Africa ranks the 10th, 46.3%, uh, and Senegal for the 14th, uh, the range of 14, it has 43% uh, of women on the parliament. Executive position, women in ministerial position as at uh, 1st of uh, 
January 2020, this year, Rwanda, eighth uh, position, 53.6%. Uh, uh, Guinea-Bissau, 11th, 50%, which is parity. Uh, South Africa, 15, 15th, 48.3%. And Ethiopia, 16, uh, 47.6%. The country also has a female president, as I stated. In March 2020, Namibia appointed the youngest minister of 23 years old, Emma Theophilis, as the deputy information and technology minister. Africa is not a short of uh, good policy. The problem has also been on implementation. The section will be looking at uh, country's experience from leader in a, a accomplishing a, a, a accomplished to women from both the public and the private sector and the proposal for accelerated implementation legislation for advancing women representation in governance and leadership i now turn to my panelists who uh, i will pass the floor the first speaker is uh, our excellence the minister for international affairs and regional integration of the Republic of Ghana. Uh, Our Excellency Shirley uh, Botswe, I hope I'm pronouncing the name so well. So my sister, on to you, uh, Honorable Minister. Is she around? Honorable Minister uh, Shirley. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Thank you. Over to you. Over to you, Minister. Yeah. Thank you. Let me thank the organizers of this forum for the opportunity to share a few thoughts and experiences in advancing women's representation in government and leadership in Ghana. At the outset of Ghana's struggle for independence from colonial rule, women played a critical role in mobilizing grassroots support for the force. Not only did they actively participate in political activities, but women also contributed financial and other material resources towards the eventual attainment of Ghana's independence. Despite this role of women in the political evolution of Ghana, it was their male counterparts who for a long time occupied the upper echelons of power. However, by 1960, when Ghana attained Republican status, the fundamental role of women in political decision-making could no longer be overlooked. The representation of the People's Bill was passed and 10 women were elected unopposed to the Parliament of Ghana. Since then, the number of female representation in Parliament has increased steadily and currently stands at 38. The country has also witnessed substantial political appointments of women into key government sectors including the executive, the judiciary, and academia. Several women are currently occupying key positions, such as my good self, also the chief of staff at the presidency, the attorney general and minister for justice, as well as the chairperson of our electoral commission. In the recent past, Ghana has also had two female chief justices and a speaker of parliament. These modest achievements by our women have proven that when giving opportunities as our male counterparts, we are capable of leading and driving the change that we all desire. In pursuit of its inclusive development agenda, the government of Ghana continuously makes conscious efforts to define, establish, and achieve political, economic, and social equality of the sexes. Various legislations and policies have been enacted to further this course, including the Interstate Succession Law of 1985, which was amended in 1991, the Labor Act of 2003, the Domestic Violence Act of 2011, and also the 2015 National Gender Policy. Meanwhile, Article 17 of our 92 Constitution prohibits the discrimination of persons on the basis of gender. In Ghana, we believe that part of the efforts to advance the course of women and our participation in governance and leadership should include educating the girl child. And for this reason, the 
current government, led by President Akufuado, has instituted the pre-senior high school education policy. This policy gives equal opportunity to the female child who either to would have been disadvantaged if her parents had to make a decision on educating her or her male sibling. A policy of this nature will ensure that these young girls are equipped with the basic leadership tools, not necessarily to lead at the national level, but to drive the required change at the community level. Permit me to quote the words of a renowned Ghanaian educationist, James Quater Agri, and he said, and I quote, the surest way to keep people down is to educate the men and neglect the women. If you educate a man, you simply educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you edu educate a whole nation, unquote. Excellencies, whilst we are all currently battling the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our daily lives, it's important that we do not lose sight of how it is affecting the livelihoods of women and threatening to erode the gains made so far in their empowerment. We must make a conscious effort not to neglect the issues of women in these challenging times. Indeed, our policy responses must take into account the multiple benefits to society when we mainstream women issues. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Honorable Minister. Uh, for your brilliant and very comprehensive and clear, clear statement uh, presentation, and uh, you know we learned a lot from the experience of your country. In 1960, you said ten women were already elected in the parliament. Very rare in Africa, and uh, as today, you you have 80, 38 percent of women on the parliament, substantial appointment on the public sector at all the, 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 the possible sector of uh, activities. You have two female chief justice and a female on the parliament. And uh, you, uh, your government uh, have, uh, under your constitution, Article 17 you, uh, of your constitution protects the right of women. And uh, the uh, president, Nanakufo uh, Ado has a policy on equal opportunity for a female child. And you say, when you educate a man, you educate a person. But when you educate a woman, you educate a community. Thank you very much for all these insights of uh, the lesson, good lesson of uh, uh, the Ghanaian uh, uh, government. Thank you. The next, uh, my next uh, uh, speaker is uh, the Director of Gender, Poverty, and Social uh, Policy Division of UNECA. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Tokozile, we, <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Tokozile, you have the floor, dear sister. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and I hope you are well. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you are. Let me start by uh, quoting the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, in a speech that he delivered at the occasion of the 2019 International Women's Day uh, commemoration. And he said, women's political representation in parliaments around the world stands at less than 25%. At the highest level, that drops to 9%. And the Global Media Monitoring Project found that worldwide, just one quarter of the subjects of news stories are women, and most, of, and most often as victims rather than leaders, I close quote. The court is profound. As more often than not, women are not perceived as leaders. More needs to be done to reform laws, to put in, in place policies. And I, and I think since yesterday, talk has been about action, action. Can we take laws and policies further and put them into and implement them? And also mount advocacy campaigns to change the perception and advance women's representation in governance and leadership. I think all my life I've been either an activist or a policymaker or involved in decisions around decision making. And up to now, we are st still struggling to have women in decision making. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for the past uh, two reviews of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, and I've participated in all of them. 
African member states have reiterated the agents of accelerating of implementation of commitments made to advance women's leadership in, in leadership, women's representation in leadership. Indeed, this issue is way overdue. With less than 10 years to the decade of action in achieving the 2030 Agenda of, for Sustainable Development, which you articulated so well, Commission. Participation in political and, and public life is, in one, is one area in which gender disparity against women is particularly stuck. This is an especially significant as key decisions about policies and budgetary allocation that have a bearing on the economic, political, and social uh, lives of communities are taken in governance structures where women, and I want to emphasize, are underrepresented. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the beauty of figures is that they do not lie. And Commissioner, you gave a good rundown of the figures of women in decision making. And I want to repeat, representation of women in leadership across Africa remains uneven. Our African Gender and Development Index uh, studies show that four countries have surpassed the 30% threshold of women in national parliament, the lower parliament in uh, parliamentary systems, a minimum target that was set in the Beijing platform for action. These countries that have succeeded all have quotas and proportional representation uh, in electoral systems. However, the lowest figures range from 6.1%, 7.2%, and 8.6% of the proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments as a percentage of the total number of seats in that house. I didn't mention the countries because I know the countries know themselves since they participated in the uh, Beijing plus 25 review and these figures were re-echoed. To underscore the agents of member states to put in place mechanisms to promote women in decision-making, I would like to take you back to March 12, 2019, where this topic on advancing leadership was discussed during a high level event hosted by the UN General Assembly. Unga by President uh, Espanos, Madam Espanos. The event was attended by heads of states, senior government leaders, officials from the UN system, the private sector, and civil society. Madam Espanos remarked that, and at the time she was the president of the General Assembly, she remarked that if women and girls who compromise about half of the global population are excluded from decision making processes, the SDGs will not be met. She also noted that a majority of, uh, the majority of countries have never been governed by a woman. And if current trends continue, it will take 107 years to reach gender parity. In this spirit, let me congratulate Madame Johnson Selif, who I always say she remains our biggest model on the continent. And she's the only one we can count as a female leader who has led a country. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in each 74 years, because I know we're asked to speak from our experiences and I'm speaking to the UN, in its 74 years of existence, the United Nations General Assembly has only had four women presidents, namely Lakshima of India in 1953, Angie Brooks of Liberia in 1969, congratulations to Africa then, um, Rashad Akhalifa of Beharun in 2006, and of course, Madame Espinola I spoke about of Ecuador in 2018. So far, and we all know, the UN has not achieved a female chief to lead the organization. Women's leadership is so critical that the UN General Assembly the, the UN General Assembly adopted, adopted Resolution 66 slash 130 on 19 December 2011, where member states globally were invited to exchange experience and best practices on, on women's sister, political my participation. Sister, my sister, my sister for, forgive the interruption. The, the interruption. We are running a little bit short of time, so I was wondering if we could move to the recommendation stage. Thank okay, so let much. me just finish this statement because I think it's very critical. Where member states globally were invited uh, to participate and share experiences of their political experience. And my statement here is, could we get the African Union to do the same? Have one of its assemblies to look at 
sharing experiences of women in decision making. Let me move on to the uh, recommendations quickly and share with you. One, it's important for us to ensure that the implementation of SDG target 5.5 is effectively implemented and this needs to happen. What else do we need to, to, uh, to do? Entrench and deepen accountability. In most instances, we don't succeed because we put rules and regulations, but there is no accountability. Three, it's important, and I echo what the envoy on youth said, to support innovation and take steps to empower young leaders. And this can be done with careful mentorship programs that motivate young people into the leadership space. At the moment, we are not giving them enough space in the leadership where women, where women should be. The third step is to ensure economic empowerment of women, which is key in unlocking the potential of women. And as ECA, and I think um, Ahuna did mention it in her remarks, we are leading the African Women's Leadership Fund as part of the African Women's Leadership Network to support young fund managers so that they are given an opportunity to be able to be where women often are not in investment. Let me also um, highlight that it's also important to have targets that are clearly defined. If I had time, I would have uh, given examples of how at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, we've, we've set out targets to be achieved by 2023 to ensure that women at different levels move to higher levels. I will stop here and I will share my full uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, my, my, my dear sister. Uh, you are very clear and uh, we like to have uh, your presentation to share because uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of statistics, a lot of achievement. Uh, I will just keep some key recommendation when you're talking about uh, uh, accountability. Accountability is very important that everything we plan, we need to be accountable to know where we are and what are the gaps and where, the, where, where is the way forward. We will share your, your, your presentation in, in the interest of time. And thank you very much. It was a very brilliant presentation. I thank you. The next, uh, uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Madame Jean uh, Chiazo. She's a chair of Women in Maritime, uh, Jean Chiazo and co, uh, and co uh, chamber. I think this is a private sector. I'll be very much excited to hear the experience from the private sector because we're talking more about the public uh, public uh, sector. Let us share also on the private sector. You have the floor. Ms. Jean, Madame Jean? And unfortunately, we cannot, uh, Madame Jean is not available, but we have uh, Mr. Gideon, who's available from the private sector. Okay, okay. He, to, he for she. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Th thank you very much, uh, moderator. Oh, I hear some echo. Over we to can you. Hear you. Yeah, go ahead. There is some echo that uh, keeps coming. Well, all the same, I think I'll continue. Oh, dear. Hello, first of all, my congratulation. My congratulation to the African Union and the United Nations Development Program for this uh, wonderful uh, conference that is aimed at um, enhancing and um, looking at the capacity of women in Africa and how we can improve it going forward. And I think I want to implore, especially the UN women uh, in Africa, and particularly so here in Uganda, for demystifying this whole concept of gender equality and women empowerment, and really having to involve women in political leadership and governance. Coming from the business uh, community, I really want to implore the efforts uh, within government
I want to implore the efforts within government that um, have helped to strengthen the public-private partnership, especially in the purview of uh, getting across the legislations and the laws that can really help us empower women and uh, bring them up forward in the leadership in business. I think the writing is on the wall. Really, uh, the youth and the women in Africa are saying one thing, that nothing is for us unless it's with us. And I think this is a concept that must ride across Africa. And I really want to congratulate the leadership at the African Union for advancing this concept. Good governance demands that we have equal opportunities across the divide, gender, youth, uh, women, the environment, we must care for the environment and all these aspects. Now, what has happened, and we can learn from history here, the reason why Africa did not perform that much under the Millennium Development Goals is because we did not pay that much attention to gender equality and women emancipation. Women at all levels, whether government, business, or household at the family level, must have that leadership aspect. They must have that leadership aspect. And I think like someone said earlier on, you, you, you empower a woman, you are empowering a country, you are empowering a nation, you are empowering a continent. And we must see this leadership come out of the women right from the family level. And I think this is where we have to challenge our women partners. That empowerment, if you are going to have participation in leadership in business and the government or even political governance, this has to come from the family level. This is where you impart leadership skills. Leadership requires soft skills and soft skills cannot be attained through educational levels. They have to come right at the family level. Someone must, must, must be able to have the capacity to critically think. Someone must be able to, uh, to, 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 have, to, to be an opinion leader and to ensure that through the education, especially for the girl children, they are attending schools right through education and are able to graduate. So what we have done in Uganda is to work with the government to ensure that we have the required legislation, the required legislation that will keep our girls in schools. I think the challenge for Africa has been the captivation under culture. Culture has killed Africa. That uh, we, women are relegated so low from education to health, even in families, we have tended to think that the boy child is superior to the girl child, whether you're looking at education or whatever you're look, 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 looking at. So this is what has been responsible largely because once you believe in that culture, then you cannot empower women, you can't empower girls to attain the education that will be able to leverage leadership when they grow up or even the skills to lead business, to have entrepreneurship and so on and so forth. So it is very important that we have the legislation, we have the regulation, we, we have the persuasion to work with men. You know, a conference like this one, and I really want to appreciate the organizers, but I want to implore you to involve more men in discussion of these issues. The challenge with Africa has been that whenever we have conferences and workshops that are discussing gender and women empowerment, they tend to be for women. We need to invite more, more, more men to take part, to be at the center of these discussions. Because at the end of the day, we are the ones that are causing a lot of gender, you know, best violence in homes and so on and so forth. And once you have this, then you weaken the other part, the other sex. So it's very important for us to look at this. What we have done in Uganda as a business community is to forge partnerships, both with the government but also with the UNDP, the UN Women. 
on gender equality seal certification program. So we are working with many businesses and I'm happy that more than 40 businesses have now signed on to the gender equality seal certification program. And what we are doing here is to ensure that we eliminate gender inequality in the workplace environment. That's the first thing. So the gender pay gaps, all this, and also to invite women participation in leadership in the boardrooms. Not many of them have been at the helm of these businesses. You get into a boardroom, you have a board meeting, and you find only two out of 15 or out of 10 board members are women. Now, this is not empowerment. So what we are doing as the apex body for the private sector in Uganda is to require that we begin to have a change mindset, especially with business leadership. If we have, uh, for, for, for instance, if you are going to form a board for an association or for a corporate, we would require that 50, at least 50% 50 of this board is constituted by women. I will tell you, the story is beginning to evolve at the private sector foundation. More than 50% of our board are now women. And we are coming from very far. <laughs> there was a time when we had only one woman on the board of eight or the board of nine. So we are beginning to tell a different story now. At the, at the political governance level, we have had legislation that have invited women at the center. For instance, uh, the parliament now, we have a parliament of about 450. But I will tell you that nearly 300 of these members of parliament are actually women. First of all, you have women representatives for every district and you have 130 districts. So every district is presenting a woman representative in parliament. That is by legislation, by law. And each of the special interest groups like youth, they are represented in parliament, the disabled, are represented in parliament. And we also have now an equal opportunities commission, which would require that if we are going to allocate resources to different sectors, they must have, they must bear that uh, dimension of gender. We must see how much are you paying attention to the special interest groups, the youth and so on and so forth. Because this is where the future is. The future for Africa is in youth. The future for Africa is in women and so on and so forth. So government has been careful here to make sure that we bring these interest groups afford. If you look at the ministries, half of the ministries are actually occupied by women. And most important, if you like, most important uh, 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 ministries, education, agriculture, to tourism, and, and so on and so forth. They are actually women represented at the helm of these uh, ministries. So that tells you a lot about political governance in Uganda. Of course, there's a lot to be done, yeah. but I think we are moving, we are moving uh, towards uh, some level of par parity. Sorry, Gideon, can I just ask for us to move quickly to the recommendations? This, I like the examples, but I think the audience would also like to hear about your recommendations going forward. Thank you. No, I think, I think uh, the, the bottom line is that if you are going to pay attention to social economic transformation in Africa, we must at all cost, whether you're looking at policy, legislation, or programs or projects, whatever it is, we must require that at least 60% of these projects are focused on, fee, on uh, females and women emancipation. If it's education, we must, see, we must be seeing more girls going to school because this is, this is where empowerment starts. You cannot start um, getting women in leadership when they have not gone to school. I think we'll have failed states. The first thing is to empower them through skills and investment in education. Let every girl child go to school. And I think this is in the confine of all African government. It must be a policy and a policy that should be enforceable. Then second, we need to care for the environment. Environment is very important. When you talk about gender, and here in Uganda, out of the 17 goals, we have said the most important goal here, or the two most important goals, if you like, uh, goal number five, which is about gender equality, and goal number 13, which is about climate change. Then the others, like clean cities and so on and so forth, can come in, but these are the two most important goals 
we who are Christians, and I've said it elsewhere, we have 10 commandments, but out of these 10 commandments, you have the two most important ones. Now, if you liken it to the SDGs, if you are going to attain the goals and the targets and Agenda 2030, we must principally focus as a recommendation, really, we must principally focus on these two goals. Out of these, you can address hunger, you can address poverty, you can address water and sanitation, you can address economic growth, you can address many other things if you bring afore the people that actually matter most for these nations. And that is the women and the youth, because that's where the future is. Someone has said that already. I thank you. I thank you too. I thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gideon. You are very, very clear, and uh, thank you for sharing the example, uh, the you know, the example of uh, good lessons of uh, the Republic of Uganda. We know that uh, we have uh, we haven't got a lot, uh, much information about the involvement of women in based in a private sector, and uh, you were able to really show us the key areas: legislation, regulation. It's very, very important to pass all this uh, legislation. It's very important to have it on the, you know, on the constitution so that uh, we can respect, uh, you know, we can respect women. And you re also highlighted the women participation on the board of directors. You are very much right because there are very few women that are part of the board. They are just interested, you know, in uh, working, but uh, no ambition. And uh, all this comes when you have skill. When you have skill, you have vision. If you don't have skill, you don't have vision. You just live in the hair like this without any projection, any planning. So I know that education is the key, is the key for human development, for human uh, capital development on the continent. I think, uh, thank you very much. It was a very rich uh, contribution for the three panelists. I don't know if our time is over, if it's so, we took a good note and uh, we are going to have all your presentations so that, uh, you know, we will follow it up, uh, all the recommendation that was given. I thank you. Thank you so I much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Josepha, for, for managing that discussion and getting those, those views. Uh, you will agree with me that the message was very clear that we need to have real commitments. We've had examples of real commitments and also examples of actions that we can we can upscale. I also liked the last point made about the need to forge partnerships and to change mindsets and, and giving uh, uh, to engage and empower women. The next panel discussion is, is going to be quite interesting because a lot, of, a lot has been made of the fact that we need to give access to financing and technology, which is a key uh, important part of uh, developing women's leadership. And to moderate that discussion for us today, we have none other than our Under Secretary General and UN Women Executive Director, Dr. Pumzile Lambonguka. She has a very strong uh, panel with her. Uh, Excellency Dr. Amani Abuzaid, who is a Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy. We have Honorable Bogolo Kenawendo, who is a former Minister of Investment and Trade and Industry from Botswana. We have uh, Excellency Dr. Bashir Ishmael Udrago. Uh, we understand it's your birthday today. And then we also have Honorable Edda Mukabaragwiza. If you can please take the stage and I hand over to you, Dr. Punzile. But we can't hear you. Thank you. Now we can, can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we no. can hear you now. Yes, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, wonderful discussion and panel and for the brilliant uh, 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 speeches that we've already had. Uh, I will not take a, a, a lot of time so that uh, we can hear as much as we need to hear from the panelists. And uh, I would ask the first speaker, who is uh, Her Excellency, Amani Abouzaid, a Commissioner for Infrastructure and, and Energy. Over to you, Excellency. 
Uh, thank you very much, Excellency, but allow me at the outset uh, to uh, uh, register my admiration to uh, all the, the panels uh, before me and the panelists. I mean, the interventions, extremely rich and, uh, and, uh, uh, and informative and uh, 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 it makes my, 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 my intervention now uh, at the same time uh, difficult to make and, and also easy to make. Uh, maybe I'll take the lead from the last intervention because I, I would like to talk about women in infrastructure. Uh, uh, I, I really thank you, NTP, and my, com my sister commissioner for political affairs and the African Network for Women in Leadership for this excellent, uh, for, uh, this excellent event. Uh, and I see that the women uh, in leadership, they talk about, I mean, different sectors except infrastructure, uh, which is really very strange. And just to give you some, some examples, uh, uh, energy, which is uh, a, a big issue for, for the continent because more than half of the population uh, uh, of our continent do not have access to energy, especially in rural areas. And guess who is doing most of the work in rural areas, whether it's in, 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 at homes or in the field? It's women. Uh, our health facilities, only fourth of them or at best 28% of them have reliable sources of energy and women suffer from that because I mean, whenever there are, you know, the uh, uh, either for pregnancy or fol following up of difficult, uh, different health uh, uh, services, they have uh, not always the adequate health care. Uh, but I want to talk also about energy for cooking. And no one seems to be talking about this except very little. And I made this, you know, uh, uh, a critical element of our program at the, the African Union. Uh, 870 million Africans, the majority of whom are women and girls, use firewood and charcoal for cooking with serious respiratory uh, diseases and fatalities, sometimes even as much as AIDS and malaria. Uh, this is very serious. Now, infrastructure at the, uh, in Africa is a multi-billion dollar uh, industry. We're talking about Africa over the next 10 years will be implemented between projects of infrastructure between 130 to 170 billion dollars worth. What is the share of women in these projects? And here I'm not talking about women only as employees or as in the workforce, no, but also as women as heads of these mega projects, as uh, 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 heads and of, uh, of enterprises. Uh, they own, they have to have a share of this market. We cannot just, you know, sit back and uh, see this happening on the continent while we are here. That is why at the, uh, at our department we created and we launched it last year, the African Network for Women in Infrastructure. We wanna make sure that we advocate and push and promote uh, 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 for women to own enterprises and to have their, their share in the market of infrastructure to make sure that they also have the right uh, support uh, either in education or in the various uh, uh, levels of the uh, supply chain of infrastructure to make sure that they are well represented. And uh, I like when I advocate for women, I, uh, I usually use business cases because this is, these are the things, I mean, how uh, often my colleagues uh, or uh, partners who are uh, uh, male or with male-dominated uh, cultures or environments, this is what they understand. Uh, women participation uh, in the workforce simply adds to a GDP 5 to 10% more. So in countries like ours that are developing and need to go even, even further, so in, 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 in making sure that women participate fully in the workforce adds to your GDP as high as 10% or even more. And if you're in a business now, I'm sure you, you are seeing what's happening around the world, especially now during the, under the COVID-19 crisis and its repercussions. The world is turning digital and the world, the world is turning in so many, uh, uh, in, in completely different direction than, than before. Talent is key. Going forward, talent is key. It's not seniority, it's not this and that, no talent. And what happens when you have a, 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 a small pool from which you draw your talent? 
you don't exist, you disappear, you're not as competitive. Now, growing your talent pool means that you become even more lucrative, more competitive, and this only happens when you have youth and when you have more women and girls in the school. Now, uh, growing forward, uh, uh, what, what, are we, what we are doing and what I would recommend for everybody to do, two things. Uh, in, in our projects, we now, uh, uh, gender, uh, uh, gender uh, uh, criterion is a major criterion and it's the one uh, upon which we uh, select uh, the projects, uh, regional projects that we, uh, uh, that, that, that we uh, include in our programs. Two, as I said, advocacy, advocacy and, and uh, 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 agency, that's very important. That's the role and that's what we are doing here as I see from, from this panel. Three, uh, I liked very much the previous uh, uh, intervention, making sure that there are that there is accountability in the form of percentages, TPIs, and uh, for boards, for CEOs, only 5% of the CEOs in Africa are women, for CEOs, for uh, project owned, and making sure that there is access to finance. And access to finance, I'm not talking about microfinance at all, and I never speak of microfinance, by the way. No, big finance, big finance. And the projects I'm talking about or the areas I'm talking about or the sectors I deal with are big sectors. And this is not about microfinance. Women deserve to have access to finance equally like everybody else. And when we say women in leadership, it's not, it's not because they make uh, 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 decisions as good as men or they are as, as competent as men but because they are different from men. And we want this different. We want this diversity. We want a different point of view and we want to make sure that the, uh, uh, to diversify the talents uh, that we have, not because we have a, a, a good a table or it, it, it's because it's nice to look at the diversity, but because we made for a better thing and we want it for our uh, 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 countries as we want it for our uh, uh, companies if it's a private sector. And I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Commissioner. Uh, all the topics we're discussing in this uh, session resonates uh, with me in my private life, uh, having uh, worked uh, in these areas uh, before. And you are so true, Commissioner, uh, in infrastructure financing, there is no place for microfinance. We need to strengthen the capacity of women to attract the required uh, funding, which is not a small funding. And we need to make sure that uh, their projects uh, are viable and bankable. And our responsibility as this collective is to input into the projects that women do so that uh, they stand a chance uh, to succeed. And we support women so that when they have problems, they know that we've got their back. And I would like to hear the other panelists also giving us uh, more ideas about how do we uh, uh, support this. I remember very well in South Africa, uh, supporting uh, women uh, uh, informed an organization of South African women in energy. Funding was always the problem whenever they had projects. We were trying to build wind farms, for instance. Problem was an issue. It was the right energy, uh, green energy. It's something that we needed in, in the country's energy mix. But the funding was always an issue because they did not have a track record. How can we help women not to be asked for a track record that they've always been denied? Without uh, further ado, I would like to ask uh, uh, Excellency, Mrs. Bogolo Joyce Ganowendo, uh, the former Minister of Investment and Trade and Industry uh, in Botswana. My sister, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's very nice to, to see ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will try to stick to points uh, that uh, have not already been starters. Uh, as we've all uh, um, agreed, it's to uh, politics, particularly uh, 
uh, women's historical economic uh, position. So we end up being very uh, challenged. And I think just at that, I want to uh, recommend that uh, we start looking very clearly at the expenses associated with uh, running for leadership positions, particularly in government, having sort of a, a curb uh, system on how much can be used because it is um, completely crowding out some people, uh, expecting uh, that uh, people already come with a million dollars run for elections, even at local level. I think that uh, is advantaged backgrounds and women uh, that have uh, an economic history. And um, I think one of the things that we can uh, deal with uh, just financial inclusion in general, um, because we need to make sure that women are uh, financially served that they know where to go uh, in order for them to uh, just be financially independent and financially stable. And one of those things really requires uh, that the legislation start to look at others other than just banks, so non-banking uh, financial institutions, and just utilize what we already have in place. And uh, one of those, I mean, if you get mobile penetration in Africa is very high and use that to our advantage. And similarly, with uh, uh, using technology, it doesn't always have to be about using online uh, facilities, but we can use what we have at this particular moment. Um, when we look at uh, more generally uh, on technology and using uh, technology, having access to technology, um, to start off with, and we don't have And uh, the challenge should be uh, that to and to the World Bank and all multilateral institutions should really consider increasing a uh, um, fund for ICT infrastructure from 4% to something around 10%. And uh, also looking at um, policy funds to, to ICT infrastructure and that equal access to technology uh, to increase from the current 1% of the 4% uh, where it currently sits. So it, for as long as we don't have the infrastructure and we're not advocating for the right infrastructure to be put in place, then we won't even have women uh, have access to uh, technology or use technology in uh, uh, their leadership, leadership positions, especially politically. And we have seen what um, the access to social media has done for a lot of campaigns. And if we are able to put women in to properly position themselves uh, on social media, how to uh, uh, properly advance their messages, there is a large ecosystem, very large uh, online that can be used in order to further uh, propel men in uh, positions of leadership. Now, one last advice that I want to touch on, um, building an ecosystem, because uh, in the into a leadership and a decision-making uh, position is not, it comes with a lot of challenges. And one of them is that there is no supportive uh, ecosystem. People will continuously have um, uh, biases uh, of that a woman can't lead, a woman uh, will have to take more time and stay home. Um, and we need to build the ecosystems. Uh, when we are appointing boards, we should appoint people that are allies to uh, our agenda, those allies in the financial sector and can start thinking but how best to leverage already the assets that already exist uh, to be used in uh, uh, accessing finance. We need to appoint people in uh, regulatory positions that are aware of the issues of women. We need to appoint people uh, that are willing mentor women, um, particularly even girls at a younger age. So it's about just holistically uh, creating an ecosystem that will see to it uh, that we have more women that are being groomed uh, for private sector decision-making leadership positions that are being groomed for uh, political and governance leaderships, but also just being groomed 
uh, to be independent and to stand on their own feet financially because for as long as we do not have financial independence, it will be very difficult for us to talk about someone having their own voice and uh, being able to um, uh, champion their own courses. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Excellency, uh, for highlighting all uh, of those issues. Um, I will now uh, move uh, to Her Excellency, Dr. Bashir Ismail uh, Oedrago, a Minister of Energy and National Secretary in charge of youth in MPP, political party Burkina Faso, and uh, ask that uh, uh, we hear a bit more about uh, how we could make sure that young people are also in the center uh, of uh, providing infrastructure and qualifying for the funding needed for them to be leading entrepreneurs in this area. Over to you, please. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about uh, this uh, very important subject. Uh, you know, I would take the example of my country, you know, about 52% uh, of the population uh, uh, are women. And uh, more than 75% of the population is uh, uh, age younger than uh, 35. So how can you imagine that we can develop our country without women and the youth? Unfortunately, when you look at uh, the positioning, you know, in the administration and uh, in, uh, in, in the political arena, you know, you see less and less uh, young people and women, you know, and uh, the decision making, uh, you know, uh, within, uh, uh, I wouldn't say the old one, but, uh, you know, some people that are a little bit uh, uh, older than, uh, than us. So if we want to change uh, uh, this, uh, this trend, we need to get first women and the youth well educated. I would say education is very important because if you understand how it works, if you are well aware about you know, how things are, are organized, then you have the weapon you know, to make sure that you, know, you can fight against all these stereotypes. So the very, uh, the, the, what is lacking you know, in, 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 in Africa as, as a whole is, is that uh, education is, is, is a problem, especially in rural areas. Uh, you can see there is a big disparity between rural area and, 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 and the city, even if it's not even uh, good in, uh, when you look at, uh, look at the cities. The second thing in education is also local languages. And I said, when you look at uh, a lot of women uh, in, uh, in our, our society, they get married very, uh, very early and they drop out of schools. And uh, it becomes very difficult for them to get into the normal system, you know, to understand, you know, uh, even to be able to talk English, French, or whatever. But you can, how can you learn if you don't understand, you know? And that's, and that's something that we are keep on doing. That's a, a big mistake that we keep on doing in Africa. We are neglecting our languages. How can you train somebody, you know, to understand politics, to understand economics, to understand technology in a language that he doesn't master very well? So that's something that we need to look at. And in my country, we are trying to push more and more education uh, to using our local languages. That's what. Once we succeed into making sure that women and the youth have access uh, to quality education everywhere, no matter where we, you are, in rural area or in a city, then we have a strong basis to go. And that's, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm finding difficult. Uh, you know, I'm in charge of the youth, you know, uh, with the, 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 the ruling party at the moment. And even at the political level, we, we lack a lot of experience, you know, to make sure that, you know, we can, we can, uh, we can get more and more position or we can win even seats. And this is something we, we need to address. The other thing is that energy today, 
energy is key to anything. Work, technology, uh, employment, agriculture, healthcare, education, you name it, you need energy. But what's going on? In Africa, we lack a lot of energy. And, and we need to fight for that. If we want to, to improve things, if we want to make sure that we empower women and the youth, we need to make sure that they have access to affordable energy, wherever they are, in rural area and in, 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 in cities. And um, the fact that we have access uh, to uh, renewable energy, you know, uh, uh, whatever it is, solar energy, wind energy or hydro energy, that can help to solve a lot of problems. And I say that because if you want to empower somebody, you, want, you need to empower that person uh, economically. If economically you are independent, then, 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 then you are free to go. But the main problem is that women and the youth, we have almost the same problem. We don't have decent jobs. We don't have access to, uh, to affordable jobs. You do, we don't have access to a lot of commodity, making things difficult because you are not independent anymore. You rely on somebody. And when you rely on somebody, eh, this guy is, uh, is your master and he does what he wants. So we need to make sure that we create enough jobs based on energy. Today, if you go to rural area, if you want to, uh, to store, for example, your crops, your vegetables or whatever, you need to have access to electricity so that you don't dump whatever you have. So even if you are working in agriculture and you don't have access to electricity, you cannot do transformation, which will give- Excellency, uh, can, I, can, Excellency can I ask you to summarize it? We are a bit short of time. Thank okay. you. Sorry to okay. Thank you. Um, I would just say, you know, I would just uh, cite a uh, true uh, important aspect, which is mainly education based on our, you know, local and native languages can help improve the level of education wherever we are. Empower women by using uh, energy uh, combined with agriculture, combined with, uh, with uh, breeding animals, combined with uh, uh, cooling and oh and so so I think if we are the possibility to help them in that in that respect uh, we are sure that uh, we'll make sure that uh, they they have main uh, main weapons you know to to defend themselves and we need also young people to get engaged politically which is important if you want to be part of the decision making you need to go and vote you need to rally you need to make sure that your voice is heard. And this is only if you have the possibility to get engaged politically. So I will stop here and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, to raise these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Excellency. Thank you for highlighting the issue of our uh, indigenous languages because without language, we have no identity. Thank you. Absolutely. And I'm going to ask the uh, coming speakers to please uh, be mindful of time. If you can, maybe just go straight to your a recommend, considered recommendations. Now we have a Honorable Eda Makuba Gwiza, Deputy Speaker of Parliament of Rwanda Chamber of Deputies. Over to you. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. I just want first to, to thank you very much for organizing this uh, uh, forum. And um, I salute also the launch of the, the action plan. Uh, I'm very happy to participate. And as you, you asked me, I go straight to the recommendations uh, for gar galvanizing actions to sustain women representation and to increase youth uh, in leadership and active participation in governance in response to COVID-19 and beyond, we need to continue mobilizing collective efforts and emphasize the following key drivers. First, gender responsive policies uh, and the legal frameworks in the enforcement, because uh, just putting the policies and the legal framework is not enough. We, we need also to enforce them. Uh, second, reinforce coordination and accountability through a focused 
machine, machinery. In Rwanda, the gender machinery is helping very much. And um, it's a synergy that we cannot just leave behind. Uh, so the, the following is to take uh, women and youth um, economic empowerment as a priority. If we don't take it as a priority and then we don't think about it in budgeting, it will be even in planning, it will be always a problem. We need to strengthen measures for capacity building of key actors, including political parties. Uh, on gender and women empowerment and youth empowerment related topics. We need to empower our political parties. I insist on this because in Rwanda, uh, we do have different um, fora with uh, political parties. They are trained on the policies. They are trained and they interact on the, 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 the implementation and it helps really much. We need to engage men for leading gender promotion and uh, women advancement transformation. That's very important. Uh, sometimes, just uh, as an example, many people wonder how um, men MPs here in Rwanda, for example, are members of our um, women uh, MPs organizations. That's very important to have men with us and um, they are very supportive in that, uh, that trend. Uh, network and coalitions with key stakeholders for forming a strong voice, mobilizing resources and effectively influencing. Uh, for sure, we need mentorship for youth engagement, girls and boys in schools for a development balanced relationship to sustain full and progressive empowerment and prepare the leaders of tomorrow. Without what I'm going to say, all this cannot happen. Above all, we need political will and good leadership. We will always talk, we will always have conferences, but we need political will from the top, um, to the end, to the, to, to the bottom. If we don't have the political will from the top, we are very um, thankful to our president, His Excellency Paul Kagame, because he's almost, almost the, the one leading all this because he has this political will with us and that political will from the president, from the head of state can engage all the country. And um, I wish to conclude quoting His Excellency Paul Kagame, our president, uh, saying the key principle, in addition to understanding gender equality as a human right, is to use the talents of all our people to the full potential in the politics, business, and elsewhere. This is common sense if we want to advance and improve our societies. End of quote. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for, for those uh, uh, remarks. And uh, we continue to admire the progress that uh, you are making uh, in Rwanda. Uh, the last but definitely not least uh, will be uh, Cynthia um, Bamalu who is the civil society organization representative and a co-founder of Yaga Africa in Nigeria. We do know that civil society uh, advocacy plays a significant role in paving the way for the participation of underrepresented group. Again, my own experience uh, in South Africa as a deputy minister of trade and industry fighting for women in the economy and making sure that they are represented in the significant sectors. I always had to consult with civil society in order to make sure that uh, they will back me up. So we really appreciate the role that civil society plays uh, in these uh, challenging areas uh, of our governance system. 
Over to you, Cynthia. I think Cynthia spoke on an earlier panel, the one with the youth. Oh, okay, um, okay. Yes. So, is 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 so? This was the last, the last. Yes, uh, this was the last. Then. Oh, okay, yes. well, then we we've, we've saved some time. Thank you so much uh, to all the the panelists, and uh, over to you. Uh, back to you. Oh. Thank you so much, Dr. Pumzile. You, you managed this panel very well and for all the, the participants uh, who spoke as well. And I think if from the chat and you will see that uh, there's a lot of conversation going on about that discussion about big finance. Uh, that has caught the attention as well as the fact that there are real opportunities to engage women in big finance, finance uh, if infrastructure projects around energy um, and, and greening, greening the economy. So these are very good uh, examples of the way to go forward. We're also happy to hear about the idea of grooming young women in leadership, uh, building supportive ecosystems and, and education and using talent. So this, this panel really uh, was able to discuss key elements uh, of what we need to do going forward to take women's leadership to the next level. Now we have come to, to the last session of our discussion and thank you so much for being with us. I know we are a little bit behind time. If you could stay with us for another 20 minutes, I hope that we'll be able to close together and, and able to, to hear some parting words. So for the last session, which is our closing session, we will have uh, will be moderated by our special envoy on women, peace and security, uh, Madame Binta Dupe. And then we will have representation from the State Minister of Gender, Family uh, and Child from the DRC. We have the Chair of the Aulon Group of Friends, uh, the Permanent Representative of Uganda. We also have the Deputy Minister for International Development from Norway. And then the closing remarks will be given by the Commissioner for Political Affairs, Her Excellency Minata Susuma, and the UNDP Regional Bureau for Direct Director for Africa. So I'd like to hand over to you, Binta for the next session. Thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup, Angela. Uh, je pense que pour moi, c'est un plaisir de venir après ma sœur uh, Pumzile, surtout pour cette session de clôture, um, et également avoir les partenaires, les États membres, et comme je dirais, les ambassadeurs qui sont à Addis Abeba. Uh, qui soutiennent uh, cet agenda pour leur engagement. Je pense que nous avons eu quatre jours de débat. Uh, la semaine dernière, deux jours, aujourd'hui, deux jours de haut niveau. Et nous avons écouté les leaders africains, que ce soit au niveau des Nations Unies que de l'Union africaine, uh, mais également uh, notre patron, qui est Mme Ellen johnson Sirleaf et la présidente Sally Wokzwede, et d'autres leaders comme Amina Mohamed qui nous ont montré comment nous allons faire pour la mise en œuvre de ce plan que nous avons adopté aujourd'hui. Je crois que d'avoir des hommes comme le président Moussa Faki était aussi pour nous un grand soutien pour l'agenda des femmes en Afrique. Donc tout d'abord, je pense que nous avons une grande dame Madame Béatrice Lomea Atilit, ministre d'État, ministre du genre, de la famille et de l'enfant de la République démocratique du Congo. Je l'ai côtoyée tantôt parce que j'ai vu son leadership au niveau du comité technique spécialisé de l'Union africaine sur l'égalité des sexes et l'autonomisation de la femme. Donc, Madame la ministre, vous allez nous dire je vois également que vous êtes ministre d'État, donc une des figures hein, du gouvernement de la RDC. Euh, nous avons 25 chapitres nationaux établis à travers le continent, et ça grâce à l'UNIFAM. Et euh, je dirais à une autre dame, Awasek Nyaï de l'UNIFAM, qui vous avez mis tous les efforts. Donc, nous avons vu que la RDC joue un rôle très important dans ce que nous sommes en train de faire avec créer l'écosystème et créer les piliers de Aulin. Et je pense qu'en tant que responsable de l'agenda genre, on voudrait voir quel serait l'apport des États membres, parce que vous les représentez tous en tant que présidente. 
de ce comité. Sur la mise en œuvre, parce que maintenant c'est la mise en œuvre dont nous devons parler, le programme est là, bien ficelé, et nous parlons de comment les États vont le mettre en œuvre en accord avec vous, ministre en charge du genre. Donc, nous vous donnons la parole pour que vous nous donniez quand même vos éclaircissements dans ce sens. Merci. Madame Béatrice Lomea à Tillit. Vous avez la parole. My apologies, we seem to have lost um, Madame, but we will bring her back. If we can go to the next panelist, please. Très bien. So let me turn on to my sister, Ambassador Rebecca Amuje Ontengo, um, Ambassador of the Republic of Uganda to Ethiopia, but also uh, permanent representative to the AU and ECA. But in particular, one what I like is that she's a chair of the co-chair of the Aulin Group of Friends in uh, African Union. Ambassador, I would like to maybe ask you how you're going to mobilize your sisters and brothers uh, to move forward this agenda, but also um, how you think that at national level. I was with you in Uganda when we were just making sure that we launched the Uganda chapter. You are one of the great leaders of Uganda, not just on top, but I know your commitment to the grassroots women. So we want to hear from you, how you're going to mobilize to make sure that we implement this agenda with our member states that you represent. Um, Ambassador Rebecca. You have the floor. Thank you, my sister, Madame Diop. I also want to thank my sister, the Commissioner of Political Affairs, Mimata Semate, and my sister, Una. I, I know how much it has taken you to put this together in coordination with other friends and sisters from the continent and from New York. May I say thank you. When I was being trained as a young leader, I was told that when you are asked to conclude, it means that it's like a cup of coffee showing you that uh, we are about to leave. And therefore, I'm going to remain within the parameter that you've given me to look into what is our commitment to all this presentation that has been made, not only the last two days, but you've been meeting different segments of our important delegation uh, for quite a number of times and a long time, I would like to say thank you. I'm not going to get into other details and dear sisters and brothers, allow me to stand respectfully on the existing protocol. But I would like to say that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has made us have an ego eye to see how far we've walked and how is the qualitative work that we've made. Has it been quantitative work or qualitative work? I think it's both. However, it has also shown us that we still have a distance to walk in all this that we've, uh, we've managed, the steps that we've taken, which are golden steps but we still have to get on. Uh, I've been a leader at some uh, middle level for over 20 years. And my dear sisters and brothers, I would like to say you, to tell you that there is no short of legislation with us. We are not short of policies and other frameworks. What we are short of is implementation. And this is what I'm coming to. I would like to say that at this point in time, we need to track where the various member states, the African Union, our partners, the REDS and other regional mechanism, institutions have failed to implement. And we ask questions. Why has it, have they not implemented this very good documents which would move the women ahead. What is the problem? 
where has it stalled? And eventually we should also find out that how do we help it to move forward? Those are the areas that I feel that we have to work on. As the chair of Aulin, in uh, Aulin Friends in Addis Ababa, I come here with a commitment which is not my own, but a commitment which is premise on the goodwill that we have, like with our chair of the African Union Commission that has accepted even to house the special envoy on women and peace and security. So we'll take advantage of that. We'll take advantage of the platform of the PRC, Public Permanent Representatives Committee. And we see how we leverage to use the spaces that we have. We'll work with the, the Department of Political Affairs. You see the zeal, you see the commitment of our sister with her team, the Department of DREA, the Department of Social Affairs, the Department of, um, of um, the Office of the Special Envoy itself. Those are the areas we are going to work in. The spaces that we've been given at this point, all the spaces we created for our, ourselves during COVID, I want to move that we should not let it die. We should instead populate it so that it keeps on helping us right from the grassroots, the local governments, the national governments, and all our regional and continental levels, uh, and, and even the global levels. I would like to say that um, the women movement has created very many leaders. I, want, I don't want to repeat what, what Gideon has said for Uganda, but I would like to say that most of those women are now in the global leadership. We have to track them down so that we, we request of them to hold the hands of other ladies who have remained behind. In this, all this that we are speaking about, even the office of the special envoy needs resources to do what we are saying. So the issue of resource mobilization is key and we should have a look at how we are going to do it. Going forward, I would like to say that we need brothers who, who will form part of us. We should not say we are leaving them behind. In Uganda, men are members of political organization where women are even in parliament. So I would like to say it is us to make sure that we bring them. We cannot do it alone. We do not have enough time, but we have to have case studies of different, uh, different countries that have succeeded and organizations. We are blessed with all these leaders, especially the ladies who have gone through the leadership uh, pillars, the platforms, and they have seen it all. They should be able to help us. Dear sisters, I make a commitment to continue working together and where we can, even if we are busy to create time and make sure that uh, what we plan for our women is done. I thank you for bringing us together. I say all this for God and my country. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Ambassador. I'm sure that uh, um, my sister Ambassador Minata, but also uh, the whole UNDP team are taking note um, on that commitment, which is uh, very much needed when it comes to uh, the AU, but also to uh, the work that need to be done at national level. Thank you um, as the chairperson of the Aulin Group of Friends in Addis Ababa. Nous avons maintenant Madame la Ministre qui est de nouveau avec nous. Um, Madame la Ministre, bienvenue. J'avais introduit tantôt que une uh, des femmes leaders de la RDC, vous êtes ministre d'État en charge du genre de la famille et de l'enfant, mais également vous êtes la présidente du comité technique spécialisé de l'Union africaine. Donc vous représentez toutes les femmes ministres comme vient de dire aussi notre ambassadeur, Madame Otengo, qui représentait toutes les ambassadrices à Addis Abeba. Donc, pouvez-vous nous dire un petit peu comment vous allez, votre commitment, votre engagement à mettre en œuvre ce plan qui nous a été présenté? Madame la ministre. 
Merci beaucoup, Madame Dior, pour la parole. Tout à l'heure, nous avons été face à des problèmes de technologie, mais maintenant, ça va. Excellence, Madame la Présidente de la République d'Éthiopie, Excellence, Madame Hélène Johnson, Présidente honoraire du Libéria, Excellence, Messieurs le Président de la Commission de l'Union africaine, Son Excellence, Monsieur Moussa Mahamad Fouakaki, j'en profite d'ailleurs pour vous souhaiter un très joyeux anniversaire tout à disant que nous avons été très réconfortés par vos propos de tout à l'heure en reconnaissant qu'une seule femme chef d'État en Afrique, ce n'est pas juste et ce n'est pas démocratique, ça nous encourage. Madame Amina Mohamed, secrétaire générale adjointe des Nations Unies. Madame la commissaire aux affaires politiques de la Commission de l'Union africaine. Madame l'assistante du secrétaire général des Nations Unies et directrice du bureau régional Afrique du Sud. Madame la voix spéciale Femme Paix et Sécurité de la Commission de l'Union africaine, Madame la sous-secrétaire générale et directrice exécutive de l'ONU Femmes, Mesdames et Messieurs, distingués participants à vos titres et qualités, tout protocole observé. Je vous exprime ma gratitude pour l'honneur que vous me faites de prendre parole à la séance plénière de ce haut niveau pour le lancement de l'initiative si louable de femmes gouvernement et participation politique dans la réponse à la COVID-19 et au-delà. Mesdames et messieurs et chers participants, partant des interventions de tous les éminents intervenants et intervenantes qui se sont succédés pendant ces deux jours, il y a lieu de constater que la pandémie de COVID-19 est devenue une crise sans précédent qui affecte fortement les moyens de subsistance la stabilité socio-économique et la stabilité de nombreuses familles et communautés en Afrique, et cela au regard des chiffres qui ont été énoncés. L'incertitude, les menaces, les mesures de prévention et de confinement contre la pandémie ont introduit de profondes perturbations qui ont eu de graves effets et posent des défis uniques et particuliers aux femmes et aux filles du continent d'une façon spectaculaire. En effet, comme de nombreuses crises passées, la COVID-19 a montré que les femmes et les filles sont touchées de manière disproportionnée, se trouvant souvent à l'avant-garde de la lutte contre la pandémie, tout en jouant peu de rôle dans la réponse à la maladie, et certains défis menacent d'annuler les gains accumulés sur l'égalité des sexes et l'autonomisation des femmes. Mesdames et messieurs, chers participants, cette pandémie a relevé à la fois des lacunes et des opportunités pour impliquer davantage de femmes dans la prise des décisions et diriger les efforts de réponse et de relèvement. L'Union africaine est confrontée au défi de cette pandémie qui pourrait annuler certains des progrès qu'elle a réalisés dans la promotion de l'égalité des sexes, de l'autonomisation des femmes et des droits des femmes pendant plusieurs décennies. Ainsi, L'engagement de l'Union africaine est à de pousser plus haut l'engagement pour l'égalité des sexes et l'autonomisation des femmes. Il est dès lors temps que des pareilles réflexions se poursuivent au niveau des États membres et renforcer les efforts pour mettre en œuvre des politiques d'autonomisation des femmes en recherchant l'égalité des chances dans tous les domaines face à la COVID-19. Mesdames et messieurs, nous soutenons ces programmes novateurs qui enrichira les aspirations des femmes en matière de leadership politique et de gouvernance en Afrique et en nous engageant à adopter cette initiative à l'attention du comité technique spécialisé de l'égalité des sexes et l'autonomisation des femmes. Nous nous engageons également à ce que les ministres responsables de l'égalité des sexes et de la condition féminine de l'Union africaine continuent de travailler avec les femmes leaders africaines au niveau national pour soutenir l'agenda des femmes, car l'égalité des sexes et l'égalité des leadership des femmes sont des ingrédients nécessaires pour mener à bien la bataille contre la COVID-19. Je voudrais clore mon propos en remerciant particulièrement nos deux sœurs, Madame Minata Samata Sesuma, commissaire de l'Union africaine pour les affaires politiques, et Madame Aouna Eziokwa, directrice du PNU d'Afrique, pour leur leadership visionnaire dans le développement de ces programmes. J'exprime également en cette occasion solennelle 
mon admiration à tous les participants qui ont pris part à ces forums de haut niveau pour capitaliser sur le leadership des femmes africaines dans la réponse à la COVID-19 et au-delà. Et enfin, notre volonté, c'est de voir les bureaux techniques spécialisés sur l'égalité des sexes et l'autonomisation des femmes continuer à préconiser une approche sexo-spécifique à l'égard de la COVID-19 et d'inclure efficacement les femmes dans les interventions d'urgence et les mesures de rétablissement. Je vous remercie pour votre aimable attention. Merci beaucoup, euh, Madame la Ministre, pour euh, cet euh, engagement assez, disons, très fort pour ce plan d'action. Mais également, nous remercions le Président de la République euh, de la RDC, son Excellence M. Kisikedi, que nous savons aussi euh, Iforchi. Nous avons besoin d'avoir plus d'hommes autour de ce programme euh, de Africa Women Leadership Network. Et je pense que vous transmettrez ce programme donc, à, aux plus hautes autorités euh, de la RDC, mais aussi de l'Afrique, des 54, 55 pays euh, africains. Uh, vous me permettrez maintenant uh, to turn to uh, Norway, and I wanted to welcome Honorable uh, Askel Jacobson, the Norway Deputy Minister for International Development, uh, who is joining us. Uh, thank you, Norway, but congratulations first for your seat at the Security Council. We are very happy and proud for that. Um, and I think that uh, my question to you would also is what the world is saying, that the countries that are led by women, and I think in your case, you have Prime Minister Erna Solberg, they said the world where the countries that are led by women are doing better. We know that it has happened before on Ebola with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf um, in, the, in, um, in the region of the Manu River, the whole region she was leading, not just her country. So tell us uh, what lesson and practice we can learn from the Norway, but also how you are going to support this program um, that we have in front of us. Um, Minister, I think you are also a he for she. I'm sure uh, my sister Pumzile have already asked you to be part of the circle. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. And, <laughs> and, and thank you, Your Excellency, Madame Diop. Um, um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me first congratulate the African Union, UNDP and the African Women Leaders Network for, for organizing this important forum and for initiating the Women in Governance and Political Participation Program. Women's empowerment are key to achieving the SDGs and the vision of Agenda 2063. A key element in this enhancing women's participation it is enhancing women's participation in political processes and governance structures. And, and Norway, as you mentioned, are a good example of that. The consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic are serious and far-reaching, even more so for women. From a dramatic rise in violence against women to a lack of access to critical health care services, at the same time, women make up nearly 70% of frontline health and social workers and carry an increasing burden of unpaid care work. We know from our experience in Norway that gender equality is key for prosperity and sustainable development. The COVID-19 crisis points to female leadership as a marker for healthier and equal societies. Societies that are more receptive to political agendas placing social and environmental well-being at the core of national policy making. We need more female representation in governments and political positions globally. Therefore, we must ensure that our response to COVID-19 or any future crisis has a gender perspective, that women are included in decision-making processes and that efforts to rebuild and stimulate the economy must target women. Then we can hope not only to soften the fall, but to build back better. This is why Norway has promoted gender as a criteria 
in the UN COVID-19 Multi-Partner Trust Fund and also the Global Humanitarian Response Plan. Investing in quality education and capacity building, particularly for girls, is the most effective way of promoting sustainable development. This is crucial for women to be able to hold political and economic positions in society on an equal footing with men. The African Union, Union is playing a key role in promoting democracy, good governance and the rule of law on the whole African continent. This includes promoting women's participation in governance, political processes and leadership. Norway is a strong supporter of your work and we are looking forward to continue and deepen our partnership in this area. We also welcome the strong partnership between AU and the UN. By joining forces, by working together, we can achieve our common objective, and that is gender equality. I thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, commitment, but also highlighting the partnership that need to be built all stakeholders, the UN and AU, but um, with the partners, but making sure that women are at the core, at the center, and the gender agenda will be the driving force in the implementation of this common agenda. Thank you, Norway. We had the privilege to welcome before uh, the prime minister in Feb February, when she come to the launch of the Africa Women Leaders Fund that we did with the head of state in February. So um, maybe uh, we have the two convener of this meeting today and wanted to thank uh, my panelists. Um, if we wanted to see our two great women who are very happy today to see the endorsement of and the commitment made by member states, uh, ministers, ambassadors, but also partners. Um, after listening to um, our dear, um, uh, I will say that Musafaki Mohammed, who made the commitment first, but also the president of Ethiopia and our patron as well. I think uh, you should be both of you satisfied that we had a successful launch of this program. Auna and Commissioner um, uh, 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 Minata, both of you should be happy. And again, I congratulate uh, those who have supported us, Norway, but also Germany. Um, and Pumzile will be uh, with, with me by thanking all that have contributed to the Aulin. I also wanted to say, do you have great support, Minata, when it comes to the AU leader, not just the leadership, but you have the commissioner of political affairs yourself by leading the commissioner for agriculture, infrastructure, the commissioner in charge of social affairs and the commissioner for HRST. All the women leaders in that room, including the technical department, the gender directorate in my office and IA office, we are all together around this program. A program of the pillars of Aulin, all the pillars, but making sure also this particular pillar we're going together to implement it. So today we say congratulations for a great launch. So I give the floor to my two sisters um, for your closing remark. Aruna and uh, Madam Minata. Aruna, you start first and Minata, you close. Or the other way around. You are twin sister, right? <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to start, but also happy to yield to the commissioner to begin. Maybe it's better she closes us out. Yes. Thank you, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of UNDP and indeed on my own behalf, uh, let me say also on behalf of the UNDP administrator who is himself. Uh, very much uh, uh, supportive of women, having uh, achieved 50-50 uh, 
uh, parity in, in the senior management of the organization, both uh, at headquarters and uh, on the ground. Uh, very quite impressive leadership at the top that we're seeing. Uh, the Commission of Political Affairs uh, of, um, of the AUC, my co-convener on her behalf as well. Um, let me say a very hearty uh, vote of thanks to all of you for gracing us with your presence, uh, both yesterday and today, and to all the speakers and panelists and moderators for sharing your very important perspectives. Uh, we are all quite inspired uh, by your great words and, and passion. I want to say a big thank you to the State Minister of Gender from DRC and Chair of the, of the uh, Steering Committee, the Technical Committee on Gender Equality and uh, Women's Empowerment at the, at the AU for her efforts uh, towards uh, achieving gender equality and women's empowerment in her country and across Africa. I must also mention a deep sense of appreciation for the Alwyn group of friends uh, members, uh, member states and development partners as well for their continued. I want to say a particular thank you to UNDP's core donors, uh, which really makes it possible for us to maintain flexible, predictable, and, and to be able to use funds in this way, uh, uh, in a strategic way both those who provide core funding, but also non-core funding, you can see the strategic importance of having that flexibility and, 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 um, and, and creativity to support initiatives like this. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to place on record a hearty thanks um, to the communication colleagues uh, at the AUC and UNDP uh, for the perfect logistic support that um, helped to guide us through these virtual sessions. Um, really, from the bottom of my heart, gratitude to the patron of Alwyn, my, uh, Her Excellency uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, president of the president of Ethiopia, Her Excellency Zwede, who also was with us here, uh, the chairperson of the African Union, uh, who is uh, a feminist leader and continues to accompany us, the UN Deputy Secretary General, um, a passionate, compassionate and determined uh, force uh, for action uh, for all that you've done to, to accompany us and to show um, the profile for, for this and the importance of this occasion. Uh, we're indebted to our two sisters, Madame Punzile and Madame Diop. Uh, you sat through these two days, uh, really demonstrating your commitment and leadership of this network. And we come behind you and promise you that we will play a part because you have played your part. You have continued to show uh, patience, resilience, but above all, optimism that this is an initiative whose time has come and that indeed we can. Uh, the wheels, ladies and gentlemen, have started rolling, uh, not just weeks ago or months ago, but years ago. It requires planning and attention uh, to detail, uh, but also it requires a movement, a movement of both spirit and body. Uh, it requires courage, it requires boldness, and it requires uh, persistence. And as we uh, look at this platform, which has been created now and launched, we have to make it count. And I'm giving you my own personal commitment and that of the organization that I work with, that we will not let all these efforts go to waste because the future of our world depends on this. We have announced already that we will support almost immediately the creation of a program that looks at the whole value chain of how we nurture and grow the, grow the next generation of African women leaders uh, on the continent across the board. Um, this is a challenge to all of us. And I know that um, many of you will play your role. And let me end um, with a quote from our patron uh, who says that if your dreams do not scare you, then you are not, they're not big enough. If your dreams do not scare you, 
they are not big enough. This was this is from uh, uh, the president, uh, former president of Liberia, who spoke to us earlier. Uh, our dreams are big, um, daring, um, and they are sometimes scary, as we've heard from the experiences of those who are attempting to enter this realm of life. Uh, but that's because they're big enough. And if we pull together, uh, we can reduce the fear and magnify uh, the courage and the delivery. So from a very personal place, and as someone who believes 100% in this movement, I want to say it's been a huge pleasure um, hosting this uh, with my sister Minata, and uh, we're energized and we go to the next step with a lot of goodwill and a lot of oxygen. So thank you all very much and uh, to be continued. I hand over to you, Madam Minata. Merci beaucoup. Merci, uh, ma soeur uh, Aouna. Uh, vous me permettrez de dire merci et exprimer les sentiments euh, de joie que je partage avec euh, vous, ma sœur Aouna. C'est quelque chose que nous avons commencé il y a plus d'une année et nous avons réussi avec le soutien de toutes et de tous. Nous avons pu tenir euh, cette rencontre. Je dois être honnête avec vous. Lorsqu'il y a eu la pandémie du COVID, j'étais très inquiète. Je me disais... Que pouvons-nous faire pour relever ce défi? Mais ensemble, nous avons pu le faire. Merci à, à toi, Aouna. Et à travers euh, euh, Aouna, l'ensemble de l'institution Nations Unies et particulièrement euh, le PNUD. Mesdames et Messieurs, tout protocole euh, du MA observé, je salue toutes les distinguées personnalités qui sont avec nous, qui sont restées avec nous. Et je ne pourrais pas, vu le temps, je ne pouvais pas, peux pas citer tout le monde, mais je tiens à dire merci à tout le monde. Nous voici au terme de notre forum de haut niveau qui a vu le lancement de notre initiative « Femmes, gouvernance et participation politique » renforcer le leadership des femmes africaines sous le thème capitaliser le leadership des femmes africaines dans la réponse à la COVID-19 et au-delà. Je voudrais dire que je suis, je, je suis particulièrement contente et ma satisfaction est grande et mon émotion également et les paroles me manquent pour dire merci à l'ensemble euh, des participants et participantes parce qu'on a pu lancer le plan d'action après plusieurs jours, Madame Diop, vous l'avez dit, après plusieurs jours de réunions et des mois de travail. Je voudrais euh, renouveler, nos leaders ne sont pas avec nous, mais renouveler euh, nos remerciements à ces distinguées personnalités qui étaient avec nous cet après-midi, Madame Salewerk d'Éthiopie, euh, Madame Hélène Johnson, euh, Sir Leaf, notre patronne, la vie, et, et, et Amina Mohamed, euh, euh, la sous-secrétaire générale des Nations Unies, le président Faki lui-même, et sans oublier les ministres qui étaient avec nous cet euh, après-midi, la ministre... Euh, 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 présidente du comité technique spécialisé genre euh, de la RDC, la présidente du Parlement de, de, du Rwanda, l'ensemble des ministres africains, les jeunes ministres qui ont pris part à cette rencontre et particulièrement dire merci au ministre Askel Jacobson de Norvège. Norvège est un partenaire privilégié du département des affaires politiques et également de l'ensemble de la commission. Merci à vous, à monsieur le ministre, et soyez notre interprète auprès de vos autorités pour leur transmettre notre gratitude pour votre constant soutien. Et nous avions avec nous également beaucoup de parlementaires et mes sœurs commissaires. Chacune a lancé euh, son pilier et chacune était avec nous également cet après-midi pour partager leurs expériences euh, 
euh, sur la manière de promouvoir le leadership des femmes. Ce n'est pas uniquement en politique, mais dans tous les domaines. Je ne saurais oublier ma sœur Bineta Job. Merci, Madame Job, pour votre accompagnement, pour votre soutien, pour votre engagement et, et également Madame Poumzile. Et Madame Awa, Vera Songwe, qui n'est pas avec nous et qui est représentée par Tokozile, nos partenaires euh, dans l'Allemagne, le Canada et d'autres partenaires. Et sans oublier les ambassadeurs à travers euh, notre sœur Rebecca, l'ambassadeur d'Ouganda à Addis Abeba, et les jeunes. Euh, J'étais émerveillée d'entendre les jeunes, il faut qu'on ouvre la porte aux jeunes. Et je salue particulièrement ces jeunes dames qui étaient avec nous et qui ont pu partager aussi leurs expériences et comment nous pouvons encore avoir plus. La relève, lorsque je les ai écoutées, la relève est assurée, mais il faut aller au-delà de celle que nous avons écoutée cet après-midi et également pour promouvoir. Et il a été dit qu'il faut faire le mentoring et chacune de nous et chacun de nous est engagé pour faire bouger les choses sur le continent africain. Les panélistes, les riches panels et les intervenants, les participants et chacun a été engagé personnellement et surtout disponible parce que les personnalités qui sont avec nous n'ont pas le temps, mais elles ont tenu à être avec nous cet après-midi et je tiens à leur dire merci, merci parce que cela, cet engagement a permis la réussite des rencontres que nous avons eu durant, euh, depuis la semaine dernière et également depuis hier. Les présentations ont donné un éclat particulier, surtout historique à notre initiative qui nous engage maintenant. L'initiative a été portée au départ euh, par euh, deux personnes et leurs collaborateurs. L'initiative ne nous appartient plus. L'initiative appartient aux États membres, à la société civile, les parlementaires, à tous les secteurs de la société de nos États membres. Nous devons tous la saisir pour la mettre en œuvre de manière effective, efficiente, et cela doit être une priorité pour nous. On a eu certaines recommandations aujourd'hui, je ne vais pas revenir là-dessus, nous allons continuer à enrichir le document, le travail n'est pas terminé. Mais je voudrais insister sur quelque chose, c'est le rôle des hommes. Merci Madame Job i for she. il y avait plusieurs i for she avec nous, euh, ce soir, je tiens à leur dire merci aux hommes et les encourager aussi à amener certains hommes qu'ils n'aient pas peur, nous sommes ensemble, c'est ensemble que nous pouvons et, et, et bâtir l'Afrique que nous voulons. Ce sont des partenaires privilégiés pour nous et nous tenons à les engager aussi dans la mise en œuvre de, du plan d'action. Nous devons aller de, à l'action et cela a été dire, on a, on a beaucoup, on connaît maintenant les causes profondes, pourquoi il n'y a pas de leadership de femmes, il faut passer à l'action et la jeunesse est là, la société civile, les décideurs du privé et du public, nous sommes tous là engagés pour mettre en œuvre le, le, ce plan d'action. Mais je suis confiante, lorsque j'ai écouté depuis la semaine dernière et aujourd'hui, je suis confiante que l'Afrique connaîtra, connaîtra justement une meilleure représentation des femmes dans les instances dirigeantes et décisionnelles à, à tous les niveaux de nos États membres. J'appelle l'ensemble, tous ceux qui étaient avec nous et qui n'étaient pas visibles, qui ont partagé les recommandations avec nous. Nous sommes tous engagés que toutes ces personnes puissent continuer le travail. On a eu des centaines de participants ou des gens qui étaient là, qui réagissaient sur la plateforme. Je tiens à leur dire merci également et que eux aussi ils soient des relais pour euh, 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 partager le plan d'action pour aller effectivement à l'action. Je suis convaincu que ensemble nous releverons le défi, le défi de la participation des femmes à la gouvernance et à la politique, renforcer le leadership des femmes à tous les niveaux. Je voudrais, pour terminer, saluer le travail inestimable de nos équipes, les équipes des Nations Unies, sans exclusif et particulièrement du PNUD, de la Commission de l'Union africaine, le département des affaires politiques, le bureau de Madame Diop, le bureau de la 
directrice, genre le bureau du président Fakir, du vice-président et l'ensemble de, de la commission d'ailleurs pour leur engagement, leur appui ayant permis de tenir toutes les rencontres et qui, tout, tout, ce travail a contribué au succès des consultations et au lancement de, de, du plan d'action et de ce forum. Et je ne saurais oublier nos amis interprètes qui nous ont accompagnés et les services techniques qui sont dans l'ombre. Et pour leur dire merci, merci pour le soutien. Je m'excuse, je ne peux pas citer tout le monde et vous comprendrez mon émotion à la fin de ces travaux et je m'excuse auprès de ceux que je n'ai pas pu citer, qu'ils qu comprennent qu'ils sont dans nos cœurs, que nous avons partagé de formidables moments pour travailler sur ce document, finaliser ce document et, et nous les appelons également à la mise en œuvre de cet important document. Sur ce, en remerciant chacun et chacune, comme je disais, sans exclusive, je déclare clos le forum de haut niveau sur la participation des femmes à la gouvernance et à la politique renforcer le leadership des femmes africaines et le leadership des femmes dans la riposte à la COVID et l'après-COVID et le forum de haut niveau qui a abouti au lancement du plan d'action sur cette question et je vous remercie mesdames et messieurs pour votre aimable attention. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Au revoir.